What's up everyone, it's Russo. I hope everyone is doing well. Please follow my Instagram at Russo Lifts just in case something happens to this YouTube channel. You can follow, message, and you can watch my daily story content on Instagram. I'll see you there. What's up everyone, it's Russo. I hope everyone is doing well. Well. Back with Blunt Biohacking. Me and Alec are back. You guys know how it is with me and him coordinating our schedules, but we have done it and we are back on a new software program. I'm always trying to upgrade the quality here. So drop a thumbs up, argue in the comments for the algorithm, but we are utilizing Riverside software. So no shitty Zoom audio. You can actually hear how good these mics sound. So I hope this makes it a lot easier to listen to. And moving forward, I will be going with Riverside for all the podcasts, right? So kicking it off, this is just going to be me and Alec catching up. So we have had, yeah, we have collected questions and we have had a bunch of things on our plates that we want to get off. So yeah, like I said, this is a host co-host thing, right? I do not direct Alec in any sort of way. He's entitled to his own opinion. However, I have been reading the comments and I will play devil's advocate to Alec much more in this podcast to kind of keep it clearly because a lot of opiate people were mad when, you know, Alec mentioned that opiates um, cause drowsiness and stuff. Alec. All right, guys, this is different software. We were just making sure Alec was still being recorded. I couldn't see him on my end, but the software records in the background. So, yeah, like I was saying, the opiate people said Alec didn't give a good representation of, like, opiates apparently make you drowsy. Ronnie Coleman was super hyper in the gym, and that didn't line up to their experiences and them going through that addiction. And Moving forward, I will, you know, play devil's advocate to Alex's opinions just to bring out a much more based discussion. Here's here's the deal, though. I, I want to touch upon this real quick. Uh, the the whole thing that uh, started with the opioids was my statement that when I personally, like this is my N1 study, uh, anecdotal experience when I did try the oxy and paired it with uh, alcohol, I, I felt euphoric. I didn't feel the negative effect of alcohol. And by negative, I mean the drowniness, the, the buzz kind of feeling that you get from alcohol. So uh, it kind of remind me of when stimulants are paired with, with alcohol and you don't you know, get the, the side effects of alcohol. Um, it's very important to know that whenever you're introducing chemicals that are, alter your neurological architecture, uh, things happen that are either expected or unexpected. On paper, opioids and alcohol are both CNS depressants. So you'd assume that they would cause high potential and that they, they would increase uh, your drowsiness and uh, it, it can lead to fatal side effects, obviously. But since uh, they also impact dopamine and other neurotransmitters and my baseline for whatever it may be during that time, at that particular moment, that affect me in a way where I, you know, mentioned on the podcast, right? So I was simply sharing my personal anecdotal experience, and I assumed maybe he had something similar like me, which which can be completely false. Like I did not make that as a as a. Uh, it was a speculation. The speculation. Yeah, and, yeah, and we we actually. Uh, we noted that it's a speculative uh, mm -hmm. topic. So we, we cannot just talk about, you know, things, you know, uh, drugs, PEDs, bodybuilding. We have to add some things that are, you know, out of the realm of facts and more so our personal beliefs, some of our opinions. I mean, it's normal. It's a podcast. So I don't know why people get mad, you know. And on the other end of the spectrum, when we did the podcast with Tony, and when I was blunt, direct, and called him out for, you know, just certain beliefs he has that are blatantly false, uh, people were like, good job, you know, you should be like that, you know, and being supportive. But if, if it's against somebody they, it's you know, idol. like more. You're, you're chirping yeah. their idol. Yeah, but if it's against Ronnie Coleman, then, you know, uh, let's lose our shit and, you know, take things personally. Like, I, I respect the fuck out of Ronnie. He's the best you know, bodybuilder in the world and nothing, you know, can be taken away, to, you know, from him. But, uh, you know, this is a valuable lesson and, you know, going forward, we'll 
you know, will wear things where, you know, it wouldn't be that triggering to certain audience because I do understand some of the people's frustrations that have went through, you know, addiction and had, you know, serious problems. So it wasn't necessarily to a fan or, or trigger them, you know, it's mm -hmm. that wasn't my intention. Yeah, so, I, I don't think it was your intention. I just think like, I must just play the opposite end of the court, no matter if I'm siding closer to you or if I'm not. Just to okay, that's just fine. to keep it base, but that's the role I'll play. You know. Okay. As far Fair as enough. like opiates with me, with my experience, I remember I had them after I had my wisdom teeth taken out, and like mm -hmm. when I drove to class, I was like drowsy. My reaction time was like one two seconds off driving to class so i what guess what did you take it was oxy it was not a high dosage mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so as far as like i feel like that's what an opiate addict would relate it to what was it was it straight up oxy or did it had a narcan in it no idea i'm not gonna talk because what they do is basically they add a, another compound uh, Narcan that actually blocks the opioid receptors and it, it blocks the high that you get from the opioids in order to prevent addiction. So, um, maybe that was, it. The, maybe that was it, you know? So, you know, I don't know about just, you know, saying that. <laughs> so, um, I, uh, I, yesterday I saw your, your videos, um, or rather video of this kid called Ditran. Uh, I had no idea what's going on. Did some uh, research, you know, looked him up, some of his posts, you know, what's the dude about. So, uh, and I formed my opinion about, uh, you know, the whole situation. You openly invited the kid on the podcast, uh, which, I, uh, you know, right away knew he would not accept because um, hey, hey, hey. I'll get it. The offer is still, the ball is still in his court if he wants to come on, right? Absolutely. You know, yeah, yeah. I'm not like... That wasn't like, oh, fuck you, I hate you, right. I hate you, I hate you. That's That was me giving my side. He was kicking me in extreme low. When he's in an extreme high, that's a dagger and hopefully a self-realization. Okay, so here's my perspective on the things. Let me interject. I think what we're seeing here is simply the physical embodiment of the archetypical 2022 influencer that simply is in a constant pursuit of instant gratification, which is achieved through uh, unlegitimate means. And unlegitimate and instant gratification go hand in hand. You cannot build something, you know, fundamentally, morally right, and that has longevity, both from uh, a moral and, and a business standpoint, with, with uh, while chasing instant uh, gratification. The problem with these people are that uh, their personality and characteristics um, are essentially having no moral compass, having no regards for others, so they have no problems putting others down and even harming them both directly and indirectly. Uh, and also they're extremely narcissistic and self-obsessed. But the thing, the problem is in 2022 is because they're getting acutely rewarded and that's the issue. 10 to 15 years ago, or even five years ago, they would have been bla either blasted by the industry or simply uh, simply kicked aside, basically. That's what we've seen in the eras of fake natties, right? Uh, where people were under contracts, they couldn't talk even about drugs, they had to be the perfect poster boys for the fitness industry. And that was the knock on Gymshark as a company, for example, that they per per uh, portrayed a false kind of narrative, you know, of uh, fake natural athletes that are, you know, perfect genetics, this and that. And people were like uh, thinking that they're imposing an unrealistic expectation and making money off of that, which is, you know, I, I agree with that. But now it's significantly worse. Like the industry has turned the 180 for the worse. The reason being is now it's a matter of glorifying drug abuse and actually building brands off of this. So like on the internet, we can be whoever we wanna be. Everybody's an influencer, everybody's an uh, entrepreneur, everybody's uh, as a lifestyle coach, everybody's, you know, all that bullshit, right? So you have this 22 year old kid that decides to call himself after a drug, right? Uh, an illegal drug and tries to build his own, his whole character and persona and, uh, out of it and actually suggesting it to minors 
And I say minors because that audience, no way 30 year olds are watching that and aspiring to be like a 22 year old going on 45. Uh, having captions on pic in pictures saying, uh, you know, they're saying I'll be dead by 45, but I'll, you know, have a big grave for this or that kind of resembles, uh, you know, when Boston Lloyd was coming up. But the problem is that when he was coming up, we were in that fake net era. Whereas if Boston Lloyd started right now, you know, rest in peace, I think he would blow up and he would be one of the biggest influencers in the game. So that's an unfortunate um, time where, you know, we're in and it really sucks that these companies are endorsing people like that they they have zero uh they basically do not give a fuck if you give them a discount if they give you a discount code and you don't generate sales for them that's enough so that tells me that there's no fundamental principles no integrity of the companies they don't give a shit who they sign they're basically after money and they're in it till you know the wheels fall off so the problem is that they're getting rewarded for it and that really sucks uh, so you know that's what really pisses me off um and you know i i actually want to take this opportunity uh to say a big fuck you to young la because they're those endorsing athletes you know such as this and you know another thing that really does not make sense to me and i'm saying this knowing that you're even sponsored by them you hey, know, you're, which this if, is all you, you're the co host. Man. If, if you, if, you know, if you want to cut out anything or, no, you know, I, I understand. Out. But the thing is that, you know, uh, there's no consistency in their approaches. So, like, what does George, George Mosvidal have in common with somebody called Baby Ziz? Like, how do you have a company? You know, what are the, the, the principles, the fundamentals, and what are their, you know, their their in common vision? What do they share together, all these athletes, apart from being drug abusers and glorifying drugs online and making memes out of them and putting caption daddy, like like this uh, kid I saw, like he puts, he likes to put that caption, like, what the fuck does daddy mean? Like uh, a father figure that should be a role model? Like, uh, is that the archetypical role model for society right now for the fitness industry? Blasting a gram and a half uh, like of, of trambolone and gram of test and like killing your kidneys, your, your cardiovascular health, your neurologically killing yourself. Like what kind of message is, portray is being portrayed? And again, the only thing, like I don't, I don't give a shit. The thing that get, makes, makes me mad is that they're getting acutely gratified by these companies if they were not they would be nobodies they would have to continue their education they would have to be somebody in real life rather than just a fucking drug abuser online and they would they would be on a proper path in life like these companies are single single-handedly ruining both their lives by endorsing them and you know the whole industries so that's what what's really pissing me off because we made a huge 180 into the whole philosophy in which the direction is going, but it's actually going for the worse. People are like, now, oh, we're respecting you, you're, you're, you're honest. Like, an, an, honest, an honest drug abuser is still a fucking drug abuser. So, like, where's the respect? Like, why is, the, is it uh, respectable? Like, why, why, have we, why are we at the point where we have to give praise for, to people for just being honest? You know, and again, this is nothing new. Like people want to start controversy. They want to do things, you know, out of the box to blow up. And that's fine. We've seen that in like the Z's era, for example, like he had an amazing personality online, but he was promoting health and fitness. Nobody saw Z's and said, I'm going to get on a ground of trend. He said, I'm going to get shredded and fuck bitches at festivals. Like, even though it's cringy uh, from my perspective right now, because, you know, I'm 25, uh, you know, uh, but fundamentally, it didn't, it didn't harm people. Right now, we're blatantly seeing drug advocation. There's, and, and, and the sad part is we're having, we, we have people like you, like me, like Derek, like so many people that are trying to cause harm mitigation through sharing information and knowledge. And in this day and age, you can Google anything and you can, you know, have an idea how to do things properly. But it's still the correct information does not out outweigh the mass adoption of steroids. Like they're getting glorified and portrayed. And now everybody in the gym is on, on, on a lot of drugs. And that's why we're seeing massive deaths in bodybuilding. 
we're seeing deaths, you know, uh, uh, people just dropping left and right. So mm-hmm. now, realistically speaking, on average, we're at a worse situation globally in the fitness industry rather than a few years ago where people were, you know, keeping quiet about these things and it was more under the table. So that's the sad part. And also not only the companies, even the social media, like YouTube, right, uh, Instagram, whatever, like they are also rewarding this type of shit. Like they're censoring people that are causing, right. that are spreading, you know, harm mitigation uh, uh, information. And they're glorifying people that are drug promoting, basically, by via just having a, a, a you know a controversial and you know uh, wild lifestyle and life choices so they're getting the views and they're basically who the the young generation is seeing and they're well, like okay the younger generation they were born in the information <sighs> era much more than us they don't want to learn they just want to be entertained and they want to vicariously live through an alpha type character lifestyle they want to live through someone else's lifestyle instead of building their own how is it an alpha alpha lifestyle if you're if you don't have a job you don't have school if you don't have proper education if you don't have you know if you don't have character being built fundamentally and you're not you know a a well-grown cognitive uh, cognitively uh, uh, stable human being how are you an alpha if everything you have is just drugs and a few supplement companies that are endorsing you like if you take that away through let's say the internet just you know you get backlash and you get wiped from the internet like in the case where with uh with shreds company for example where are they now they're gone how many people in the industry have been like that and they just disappeared you know just because the wheels fall off so you know it's a matter of not having a pers- perspective and a vision for the future. And this is basically a, a, a lifestyle and systemic problem. It's not necessarily just in the fitness industry. You know, most of the people don't know what they're going to have for the next meal or what they had for breakfast or what they're going to do later on. So it's more about now. It's a, more about instant gratification rather than where am I going to be in three years, five years, 10 years, you know, and that's the same longevity is everything. I, I agree on this monologue. I mean, I'll play devil's advocate here with D Trend, even though I made the video on him. And, like, I'm not a player hater. Like, I wish this dude well, but, like, a chirp's a chirp, right? And, like, you're, you're going on your rant, but, like, let's, let's be more constructive. Like, let's say he came on this podcast, Alec. What right. actual, you know, insight would you give him other than. Like anyone could be uh, torn apart. Him? Anyone could be no. torn apart. You could tear me apart. I could tear you apart. Right. What, what no, actual not, insight would you give him? No, I wouldn't tear him apart at all. It's basically objectively looking at a situation. I would ask him, you know, how he actually, like, what actually made him pursue that persona, you know, and take that approach that he took. Because again, this is a choice. You know, the whole approach he took is his choice he he thought about it he started his tiktok or instagram whatever and he's playing this character like i would ask him what is his short-term and long-term goal like whether he cares about society like how what, how is he affecting others whether whether he thinks that this is hindering his credibility down the road you know does he feel responsible for things he's saying and doing you know like just basically trying to get the answers out of him and when he says, you know, if he does say things that, you know, he thinks that he's doing wrong, that's the only way where when he can change, you know, change does not happen random. You just don't wake up one day and say, oh, I'm going to fix everything. I've been doing this all wrong. You know, holy shit. You know, something has to happen acutely or chronically, but it has to be drastic where you're forced to make a change. People do not change randomly. Like they're forced to change. And extreme changes are usually forced extremely, you know, like you cannot be a completely different person and say, now I'm trying to mitigate harm and this and that. But listen, this drug really is so amazing and it made my life better. And now I'm sponsored and here I am with the money and the cars. 
let me let me give you an example. Let me give you an analogy. Imagine me starting my own techno channel right now, right? And I go to techno parties and I log I vlog my, my, my experience, right? And I start shooting heroin. And I come up on camera and say heroin is the best fucking drug ever. Like I was so happy on heroin. I was so like nothing comes close to heroin. It's so amazing, guys. And start uh, sell shirts with hashtag, uh, you know, Alex Heron or something like that. And basically popularize it jokingly, you know, because it fucking works, right? And yeah, build it, off it, of like you hide behind the it's just trolling or I'm just like acting out a joke. When no, you it's look not at a the joke. Age of the audience and like no, no, for no, me, no. I relate this to myself heavily because like I was like one of the ones who trailblazed it right right i had the choice of the characters i could play and i picked like the nerd this isn't funny this is changing your biochemistry like i attached no emotion no coolness to it all harm mitigation but in my right. mind back then i was like yo like what if i just play this up like i'm the man like you know i'm juicing like more of like how tony played it like like when you look at like Tony's happened? influence and I'm like, I don't want to go down that path. That path might get me more attention instantly, but then later down the line, whose reputation is still more reputable. That's what I was saying. What happened with Tony? What happened with EA? What happened with, with everybody? That's, that's basically proving my point. Consistency and longevity is basically just built through integrity. The moment you lose it, you're losing your ID and you don't exist. Mm -hmm. You're basically a whore. And that's pretty much it. There's no way around it. So you cannot say it's a joke if you're doing it. Like I can joke around and say, you know, uh, something like, uh, I don't know, like taking a certain drug to feel better or whatever, but I'm not taking it. So then it's a joke. But if like my whole persona and brand is built upon that drug and glorifying it, then it's not a joke anymore. You know, you cannot say, bro, it's a prank. You know, you people do say that when they need an excuse to run away from, you know, facing repercussions or, you know, being challenged. That's the only thing. Yeah. So th that's that's exactly why I think, you know, um, he wouldn't show up on, on, on the podcast because, you know, I want to have it out with him. You know, I was <clears throat> waiting to be reached out to him after that video. Never reached out followers did it nothing back in return you know if this was me getting that type of video sent to me i would immediately call that person and try and come to some common ground yeah but nothing. you don't have anything nothing. you don't have anything to hide that's so, the so, difference so what do i do i have his direct okay he's had my direct the whole time i have his direct right so he was going around saying that I never reached out to him in private. I did it in the young LA chat. I threw up those screenshots on the story proving I did it. He ignored me. He was bigger than me. You know, he moved on and he probably, I hope had self-realization what he did at the time. I don't know. Nope. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. I'm playing, I'm playing the benefit of the doubt. I want D trend to succeed here, but I reach out to him and I'm like, I sent him the screenshots. I'm like, I did reach out to you, boss. And he's going into like how I'm immature for making that video. And it's like, you get what you give, right? I stooped I, I down and I made an immature video back at you for the immaturity received at me. I was Let not me. trying to be the bigger person. That video is just as cringy as him coming at me. I'm giving him what he gave me. That's it. He kicked me at my lowest when he's at his euphoric high on the Mawcast. Everything worked out. That's when I hope he has that self-realization from that video because that's a paradigm shift in his head. That's a change of energy in his head. And all that wanted was self-realization. Let me ask you this. Whenever you're on top of your game, whenever you're having everything goes going your way, that's when you get cocky. That's when you get, you know, uh, when you're fully of yourself. That's when dopamine is through the roof. And also, you know, drug use also enhances that. Do you have time to write comments on somebody that's borderline suicidal and comes off out of, you know, suicide attempt and put him down? Like, do you have the time to do that? Like, are you, 
Like, I never read a that? negative comment ever. Ever. So, so my point is, if he did that while he was at his highest, that basically no, this was, is... This was when he was only on TikTok <sighs> and he was looking to build his Instagram. So he was clawing at uh-huh. any way to do it, right? Yeah, so the instant gratification like, argument. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. This is what I think his vision is. Like, he was probably getting linked to my stuff or be like, you're pretty similar to Ryan Russo. And he probably looked up Ryan Russo and saw this fat dude. And he's like, why the fuck does this dude have all this attention? This is undeserved. He never looked into my like years of content or realized the current situation I was in. And How just started going to at it because of the content he makes. He makes PD content. Oh, really? Then definitely I'd love to have him on the podcast. Hey, I'm sure I'm he's the, very dude, well versed it, on it. it. It's open to him, man. All right. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, the clip that you sent me of the mod ca- of the mock cast, uh, there was um, him saying he did uh, more than a gram of trend. So, um, like I everyone's mean, like, so everyone's coming at me like, oh, like he never, like he only recommends 500 tests with the oral. And I'm going into, I think, you know the big Instagram guy, Noel? Yes. I'm pretty sure he made reels that countered what D Trend was doing at the time when it came mm-hmm. to like I don't think D Trend I think D Trend is in this position where like he's joking being sarcastic but not having the self realization of yo, I have a massive audience. All these dudes look up to me, all these dudes vicariously live through me. I am directing their path indirectly. So even if I'm joking about, oh, nope. like run train at your first cycle, I can't do that. I can't go no, on. Like you have a self responsibility when you have an audience. I get blasted all the time by all these people. Like Russo, you have a self responsibility with your audience. You have you're in a position of power. You have to be super careful with the information you put out. This guy gets a exactly. free pass. These younger guys get a free pass. Right. Who gives him the free pass? The companies and the algorithm. So I'm not going to hate on the algorithm, obviously, but I can hate on the companies, and I, I will. So that's a big fuck you to them. I don't know. I just wanted to hash it out. and like, Anyway. Like, for me, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap this up. Yeah, it's... For this me, is it more was so- like... I, I came and messaged him. We went back and forth. You know, I was called immature, which I agree, right? I stooped down to his level. I was immature. I wasn't trying to be the bigger guy. Not at all. No, just self-realization. That was all it was, right? He's in this euphoric high, and I come with the dagger. That's hopefully some self-realization from him. But really, that was the final ploy for him to get on a call with me and have an interaction with the voice back and forth, right? He chose to text it out. That's, yeah. that's the ploy. If he was real, he would call me. You know, me and Boston Lloyd got in an even more heated argument. I made even more shit talking to Boston Lloyd. What does Boston do? He messages me, hey, man, when is you – like when do you have free time for a call? I want to call you and talk this out. Me and Boston talk for an hour and a half, and we are both laughing yeah. and smiling at the end. That's what a man does. He's calling me not a man. So I gave him a ploy to call me in private, right? Mm. This conversation didn't even have to have live on this podcast. That's what he chose. No. How many ploys do I got to give him? No, this conversation is not about him. Uh, I brought it up simply because of the audience that are listening to things, to this thing. And and I want them to think about the longevity and integrity. This is basically a valuable lesson uh, from a business perspective. So this is the only reason why I brought it up. It's not necessarily that I give a shit about, you know, some individual online. It's more so about, you know, having the vision. And, and I'm, I'm basically um, talking about the path that's that in, in this situation he chose. And I'm, you know, saying the arguments against it. It's nothing personal, you know, as I, I mean, he doesn't impact me and, you know, I could care less. So the reason why I brought it up is simply because of the educational aspect of it. Mm-hmm. So that's that's why. And I also wanted to address the whole industry thing because it's happening, you know, and nobody really talks about it and it's a huge 180 for actually the worst while they're, while they're you know, uh, hiding under the premise of being legit and honest. 
you know, while they're actually causing more harm. And again, the whole thing with, um, you know, the inconsistency with sponsored athletes is so funny to me. Uh, I saw the UFC Masvidal with, uh, uh, with the young LA uh, tracksuit and I was like, no, this is fun. There's some funny shit. So, you know, imagine uh, George and uh, I don't know, whatever, like uh, this D trend dude or that kid, baby Z's or whoever, like talked about uh, diet, nutrition, PEDs or fundamentals or, you know, anything, you know, just imagine them having a conversation. I cannot. Well, I think you're, you're like, you're thinking about hardcore brand integrity. They're thinking about what's called a blanket affiliate network. An affiliate network that reaches out as wide as it can, right? That is what their goal and focus is as the business. When it comes to scouting and integrity, as the business gets bigger, that goes out the window. And we've seen that with Gymshark. We've seen it with Gymshark to a point where it's funny that you like throw Young LA under the bus. When Gymshark has become so woke that they're making crop tops for men. They're literally, they just have a group of pink haired people in a boardroom and they're like, right. how do we get more sales? Right. right. Who, who cares that Jim Shark started off as you're the shark in the gym. I'm the big bad shark in the gym. Right. Everyone's looking at the shark in the gym. Do you really think someone's looking at, you know, the dude in the crop top or the girl who just goes in and takes pictures and like doesn't even lift and just, you know, has the gym outfit. Right. You see that Bev Francis guy sold his brand. I don't know how you go sleep at night knowing that your baby was destroyed. What? Is that extra money worth it? You can always make more money when you make that much money. You can always sit there and multiply long money. But for you to sell your brand and watch it do that? Uh, the, the Both end of the spectrums and both extreme are bad. The middle is where you know things should be at. But again, the guy in the crop top is not fucking harming others. He is not... The crop tops are not fucking with the endocrine system of others. It's not causing direct, you know, heart issues, kidney issues. Where on the other end of the spectrum with, you know, drug glorifications and starting trends like that, that's directly negatively harming society. So I don't like either end of the spectrum. I'm just saying objectively speaking, Jim Shark is better for society in general. Surely, just purely because they're not fucking people's sales up directly. Mm -hmm. so that's that's no matter how you flip it you know so you would rather lean towards the extreme censorship than young la which is too loose and their athletes are all like running amok essentially i don't i don't think it's that extreme censorship chris bumstead for example sponsored by jim shark he does talk about to a very small extent about you know drug use um, he avoids the questions, but he does acknowledge that he's on drugs and things like that. So, so it's very minimum. And I think that's that's way better than drug glorification. So objectively speaking, for the young audience, for the minors, like that's the problem, the minors. For the, you know, people that are 20 and above, you know, they're, you know, grown men. So I don't, I don't care. But realistically speaking, looking at the demographics um, and who is on TikTok, you know, it's not you, it's not me, it's not, you know, it's not grown as men, it, they're, they're children. So that's the thing. And they're setting off trends and, you know, it just creates an army of people that would be fucked up later on, both physically and neurologically. Because even interestingly, uh, you know, let me say this, for example, uh, like trend directly is linked to Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, it really screws the dopaminergic reward system in the brain more so than all of the other, you know, common androgens that are being used in bodybuilding. And also there was a meta-analysis uh, cross-reference study where they, they were, they basically inspect young athletes who had acute cardiac arrest. So like they had natural death from unexplainable reason, basically. And the one drug that was basically in, in, uh, in common with everybody was, was tremble and they all had tremble on metabolites in their system so like it it, it act it, it directly harms the heart the blood vessels the kidneys 
the liver, like it's liver toxic even though it's injectable, and also indirectly through mediating, uh, increasing uh, the sympathetic nervous system, through increasing noradrenaline, through increasing, you know, decre increasing insomnia, and, and uh, all of the other, you know, typical androgen related side effects, it cause extreme harm to the body. So like, no matter how you look at things, trend is really bad. Like the, the worst drug from a bodybuilder perspective that you can take. And staying, you know, start off with that, like what the fuck? <clears throat> well, I'll play, I'll play on D Trend's side again, right? When I look at, you know, James, Sush, D Trend, right? They're younger than us, right? They're around 21, 22, right? Sure. Your primal frontal cortex is still open. They still haven't like discovered themselves as a man. That normally takes place between the age of 23 to 25. So our cortexes are pretty much closed, right? Our brains are fully matured. They're still figuring themselves out. You know, I'm not like coming at D trend like, oh yeah, but man, I absolutely let me hate interject. You. But for once, like, have some self realization is all. Let, let me interject here because you mentioned the, the the frontal cortex and the brain, and from a neurological standpoint and from an endocrine standpoint, the nervous system and the endocrine system are both just signaling systems. One uses hormones, the other one uses neurotransmissions uh, and electrical signaling. They're linked together. So one impacts the other. When you're directly messing with both the, with the endocrine system, you're messing with your neurological uh, architecture. So you're not going to develop to the person you would have if you do this. And you're going to turn uh, to a worse person down the road, to a, an unhealthier worse person both physically and neurologically so that's the point that i'm trying to say if you if you fuck up with let's say you go to a party right and somebody gives you drugs um and you you know you get wasted or you get wasted on alcohol you'll cause acute damage to your body you know you'll feel nauseous you know you'll feel like shit for a few days and you know you'll you'll revert back to baseline if you screw your your uh, endocrine system up and you screw yourself neurologically, you're screwed for a long ass time, potentially for life. So like the the pressure and the, uh, and the accountability is significantly greater in this aspect because the harm is actually way worse than giving somebody bad advice on training, on diet, or even giving them, you know, uh, you know, bad, uh, you know, party drugs or alcohol or whatever. So like the pressure should be significantly greater here in this situation rather than anything else. I agree with that. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I, I see evolution in him. You know, I see the self realization. He's trying to get away. Like I said in the video, like he's D trend 2.0. I like D trend 2.0. You know, D Trend 1.0, who trolled me a year ago, I had, you know, I, I didn't understand that at all, you know. But even 2.0 is ducking you, so if he's still 1.0, I just don't think he wants just a modified. conversation. You yeah. Know? Whatever. I've let's, had conversation, let's... like, I've fucked up in my life. I've done dumb shit in my life, and we'll people, have. Have, people have chirped me in conversation. And sitting right. down and receiving that chirp made me a better person moving forward. By exactly. ducking and avoiding me or negating me as the immature person when I'm giving you what you gave me is not being a man. And he didn't call me last night, and that was a final ploy. Obviously, the invite is still open for him, and Alec and I would like to talk. But right. like, how many chances do you get at this point? And him saying I slander and lie, I just said my angle, man. That was legit, legitimately my interactions and observations. Uh, interestingly, I just uh, remembered you put a story yesterday up uh, of a group chat uh, that you're in. I think it was with uh, with uh, the members of the it's all LA, the I think. sponsored Young LA guys. Right, 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 right. So when he joins the chat, you know, there was a comment by somebody you know uh, said oh we have to i have to start abusing more uh, train or something like that in order to make sales so that comment you know what i'm referencing right you can put up that screenshot uh if you will 
Um, you put it on your I'll story. Have, I'll put it in after. I have to blur everyone's number out. I don't want to dox anyone, Okay. But it, right, right, right. Up right. Yeah, now. you don't want to get a lawsuit. But point being is that that statement right there, again, just solidifies what I'm talking about these companies. Like, you, you just read the, the comment. Uh, just read it directly because you're on your phone right now. No, they're just, they're just hyping them up. They didn't really. No, no, no. But yeah, but there was a comment. Uh, I think by the dude, baby, uh, baby Zis, he says I have to up the drugs or trend oh, to make. Oh, okay. Yeah, Patrick Dawn. So this is after. So I said, um, I said to D Trend directly replied to him, which he ignored at the time because remember. He's already bigger than me. He doesn't give a yeah. fuck about me, right? So mm -hmm. I'm already irrelevant in his mind, right? It's only until this yeah. trip becomes public does mm -hmm. does the switch right. up to nice guy happen, right? Exactly. So exactly. he ignored me. Anyways, after he ignored me, Patrick Dawn says, I'm going to have to blast so much trend to make sales now. So, yeah, you, you did, see you did yeah. remember to a T. Yeah, so you see, that's, uh, that's basically what I'm referencing. And that's not a joke. Like, that's the reality. Like, that kid's going to fucking blast his, uh, you know, head off in order to generate sales. And the company's owners are, are you know, they know this and um, they don't give a fuck. Mm. So, yeah. Enough of that. You know, yeah, I just wanted to, that, yeah, to I discuss think that's this. That's a perfect conclusion. So, yeah. Uh, like I said, you know. the invite is open. And I am not here to be like, oh, I hope for your downfall or nothing. I hope you continue to go to the moon, man. I hope that you have a little bit of self-realization. That's all I wanted. I didn't want YouTube views. I can get YouTube views. I have legacy clout. I could just make two videos with Alec and get the same amount of views. That was specifically made for you. That's like sitting through a bad trip. I used to trip on acid when I was younger. And each time I tripped on acid, right? All the fucked up shit I did, I had self-realization. It hit me like a ton of bricks, like, oh, wow, I am a piece of shit asshole person. Oh, wow, I am going down the wrong path. And if I continue down this path, like instant happiness is going to come, but later it'll become empty. Later, in my opinion, it'll become empty. And that's all I'm exactly. trying to give to you, man. It is nothing negatory, negative or derogatory. It's simply a little realization, not for views, not for clout. Sure, I'm immature, right? But you were immature to me. So I'm just going to, I'm not trying to be the bigger man here, right? I'm just trying to give you what you gave me, and that's it. All right, moving forward, I did want to touch on to the topic of why do you not have SARMs in my prep? Because this is okay. going to be a popular video topic. So. Obviously, I'm noted for documenting all the SORMs only and then doing SORMs only hybrid cycles where I did build okay. a pretty decent physique on right. injectable LGD, injectable YK11, and a baseline of testosterone. Same thing with me with S4 and growth hormone. Yeah. You can show up some of, of my pictures. Yeah, we'll put up pictures. Andrew put up pictures. But like a lot of people don't know, Alec is the one who did even crazier SORMs only experiments. He just didn't do it on YouTube. Alec is the true yeah. underground biohacking goat that is the same age as me. And I got no problem giving Alec the credit he deserves. But he's the one who did S4 only, had no hair loss. His PSA, his prostate wasn't binded with at all. And he's extre it actually, extremely it actually shredded was. looks from the cycles as well. And then you switch to gear as well. So why in this contest am I only on gear? Okay, so let, let me touch upon a few things. First of all, from uh, the whole biohacking thing, when I started, you know, I was uh, first using steroids and I had side effects. I had uh, crazy hair loss. I had, you know, I, I got gyno and I was not growing to the, it wasn't meeting my expectations. So um, during that time, you and Derek were, you know, starting off basically uh, and you were touching upon all of this. Uh, so I basically started just around the same time as you guys did. Uh, and that's why we even know each other. You know, I'm friends with Derek as well. Um, and so are you. So uh, I wasn't just never using, um, you know, Europe because uh, I'm from Macedonia and, you know, the algorithm doesn't, doesn't, you know, work well for us here. So I didn't have 
I didn't have even the, the intention to get cloud or anything. I didn't give a fuck about that. But, I just um, think you, you don't want it, right? It's it's a trade-off, nah. you know? And it's I, a bad trade-off. Everyone should commend Alec for coming in the spotlight. Because back then, me, Derek, you know, we were in the spotlight, right? All the biohackers were like Alec behind the scenes. Alec would talk to us. But when it yeah. comes to getting in the public and making that image of yourself, it, it, there weren't that many people back then doing that. Yeah, I've been sending I've been sending blood work to Derek. I've been discussing ideas with him for years and with you. The whole thing is that uh, I'm not used to the whole uh, drama going back and forth. Like things affect me more so than than uh, I assume you guys. You know, I reply when we do podcasts. I reply to every comment in the comment section. You know, uh, regardless like how big am I or how small am I in regards to following and you know, uh, I try to get back to everybody even on Instagram. Like I spend all my free time and my whole day basically doing that. Um, so, and, and sometimes when, you know, I have opposing views with the people, like I get into, you know, uh, basically debates for hours and it really sucks me dry. So that's another reason why I never really uh, went into this, you know, hardcore like you guys did. Cause I, I have a problem, you know, blocking out the noise. And I really like when people are doing something wrong or potentially harming others, like I have to step in, you know, mm-hmm. that's my problem. Like that's the way I am. Um, that's why you even brought up the whole D trend thing. Um, you know, where probably like, you know, sometimes it may end up like, you know, somebody gossiping or talking about others, but you know, I think that there's a great responsibility, especially in a uh, industry where, you know, uh, performance enhancing drugs are, are, are utilized. So, um, that's, that's basically that as far as the SARM thing goes, uh, the problem that um, arises with uh, with uh, using let, let me let me start like this first of all because I had questions about um, how to choose steroids even in regards to uh, side effects like uh, hair safety, prostate safety, things like that. So anabolic androgenic steroids is in the name AAS, meaning they're they're mediating their anabolism through binding to the androgen receptor. They're like keys to a keyhole. Uh, and then when they bind to it, they cause, uh, they, they activate it, they, they agonize it. Now, the whole thing is that certain drugs, certain compounds, both uh, SARMs and, uh, and steroids, have a different affinity and different efficacy in activating the said receptors. So, like, some something can have a high binding affinity to the AR, but can have very low efficacy as far as activating the, the, the receptor itself. So... For example, S4 or even Austrian or whatever SARM in studies, they all, they have higher binding affinity than testosterone mm-hmm. milligram per milligram. So they 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 but so that, but, let's uh, simplify it. So binding affinity like the testosterone and S4 racing to the AR. The yes. S4 is always going to beat the test. Exactly for like yes. simplistic terms. Exactly. So that would le- basically lead to more either DHT conversion via the 5 alpha reductase enzyme, which would lead to more androgenic side effects of testosterone and less anabolism, because DHT is less anabolic than uh, testosterone, but more androgenic. And then you have the problem of also increasing aromatization. So the the aromatase enzyme will be, you know, more filled from, you know, aromatizing androgens, and you'll have more uh, uh, estrogenic side effects. So and also, SARMs are great to a certain extent. Once you reach a cap point where more does not do, you know, yield more results, that's their flaw. With steroids, in general, more somewhat gives more results, somewhat to a certain extent. But their their leeway is significantly significantly greater with steroids than with SARMs. So, like. At low doses, osterin can outperform testosterone both at uh, binding affinity and uh, binding efficacy. So, like, you'll get more gains from osterin rather than, uh, let's say, 100 mg of testosterone. But if you take a gram of testosterone versus whatever fucking dose of osterin, a gram of testosterone will always be as far as efficacy and muscle building will be, be at osterin. So, when you're in prep and you're using higher doses of, uh, you know, uh, of androgens, there's no point in adding something with higher 
a binding affinity, but less efficacy. Right. So that's for, why you're again. I'll interrupt one more time with simplistic terms. Like Alex basically <sighs> saying, like the hierarchy of what is going to bind to the receptor. Meaning, if there's a lot of the SARM, it's going to mess up all the other androgens binding to the AR and cause more free testosterone floating around, not binding into anything, which is going to convert into estrogen and DHT. And then the other point Alec made is that you can't really dose SARMs higher and get more results out of them. There kind of is like a sweet spot, and then it really falls off to where steroids are more linear as you go higher in the dosage. Exactly, exactly. So that's the thing. Uh, so um, if, if if there was a, if you if, you, if we had like an um, uh, like a maintenance like a cruise sort of speak situation with you like post show for example, then yeah, utilizing some SARMs and peptides, you know, uh, because they're not the whole idea when you're um, off basically, apart from fixing your biomarkers, is to lower myostatin because androgens increase directly myostatin, which is a, an inhibitory protein that inhibits muscle growth. So like in studies, for example, when they compared testosterone to trembolone, within a few weeks, trembolone raised myostatin by 350%, whereas testosterone did so at 100%. So like when your uh, the more your myostatin is getting elevated, the more uh, diminishing returns you're seeing as far as you're not going to grow more and you'd have to increase your androgenic load and you'll have more side effects. So when you're going off, the whole idea is to also refresh your androgen receptors or rather decrease myostatin so you can grow later on. So utilizing SARMs, because they're very low androgenic, uh, they're not going to mess with your recovery and you can utilize them, you know, when you're on a cruise, for example, like post show, for example. So um, that's when they can be utilized, in my opinion, in conjunction with TRT and with steroids. And with the pros that Tony and I have talked to in real life, they love bridging between their cycles with SARMs. Because, like, you would think, like, competition blast, you take so many steps forward, come off the competition back into a cruise, you take so many steps backwards, adding that bridge of SARMs in there keeps your steps forward a little bit more forward. Would you agree, Alec? Yeah, exactly. That was my point. That was... so. Uh what I was uh, going at. So um, that's when we will utilize them. Um, as far as um, other things, uh, I mean, secretives are not utilized in MK since you're using growth hormone or bypassing, you know, the... the it's just like with the secretagog, like MK677, I've, I'll have Andrew put two <clears throat> cards up there discussing the side effects, but like... I would just be dealing with insulin resistance the whole time to an extreme degree versus growth hormone has been much more manageable. It's not only that, though. Um, uh, MK is a uh, growth mimetic. Uh, it simulates the hunger hormone, mm -hmm. uh, which is basically secreted by the enteroendocrine enter cells in the gastrointestinal tract um, that, uh, that essentially increases uh, noradrenaline. So it can increase anxiety. Right, uh, I'm talking about NK677, mm -hmm. and also it increases uh, appetite, and therefore it's counterintuitive in prep. On the other end of the spectrum, growth hormone increases cortisol breakdown, thereby shifting your nervous system into a more parasympathetic state mm -hmm. and more calming state. Mm -hmm. So growth hormone from uh, an aspect of having lesser anxiety and being more calm, which will also translate into, you know, uh, better sleep, better, you know, just overall better quality of life, essentially, um, especially since it's, it's compromised during prep. Um, I think that's a great, uh, a, a big uh, plus on the on utilizing growth hormone, and uh, that's why you cannot be a cheap ass and you know say I'll just use uh, MK six seven seven because it's not doing the same thing. And another thing is that you know, when you're shooting growth hormone directly, it doesn't matter whether you're um, in the fast Whether you're fast, yeah, because you're basically yeah, triggering fat lipolysis. Let's, let, let, let's go uh, into that because that's that always cracks me up. Like, people be like, My MK677 is bunk, and I'll be like, Well, when are you dosing it? And they're dosing it like right after your meal, it's only so, going to work in a fast so, state. So, the thing is that with MK, uh, it has a long half life, so 
like it's gonna work regardless. But the thing is that with both secretagogues, with uh, either peptides or non-peptidic uh, secretagogues and ghrelin mimetics, you have to, you're bound to the natural uh, rhythm of growth hormone secretion, and that's when insulin is not present or rather very low. So you you have to ab- abide by those laws and be essentially uh, fasted to a certain degree uh, in order to utilize and reap the benefits, the lipolytic effects of growth hormone. You're still utilizing the uh, intracellular water retention, the activation of the raw system. You're still banking on, you know, increasement of uh, IGF-1. So like that still is, ha- is happening. But also the problem is because the bleed is so long, you're developing significantly more insulin resistance disproportionate to the amount of growth hormone that you're um, having elevation of. So for example, if you were to shoot three, four IUs of growth hormone, you would have higher IGF-1 and uh, serum growth hormone levels with less insulin resistance than had you uh, utilized um, NK677. So from a health perspective, you know, it's better to just utilize growth hormone. Um, What's your experience with 677? Sorry to interrupt you, but like, I'll go into the one strange study. I don't know if you've read it. I'm sure you have. You've read all the studies, but I don't know, like the GNRH receptor that MK677 operates through is located in the fear part of the brain. And you see the one study is like tremors, tears and stuff. Not only that, uh, you're referencing the amygdala. Uh, which is the anomalous size uh, gland in the brain is the part of the limbic system. Uh, and that's where uh, fear and aggression are being formed. Um, and uh, the thing that I basically mentioned prior, as far as being a ghrelin mimetic, it stimulates noradrenaline. Noradrenaline is a excitatory catecholamine, which is basically a, a stimulating neurotransmitter. So, like, it pu- it's, 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 it's a neurotransmitter of the sympathetic nervous system when it's getting activated, and thereby it shifts you in that direction. That's why I told you prior growth hormone is superior than MK677 as far as managing anxiety, which, which uh, you know, intertwines with the, with the whole fear argument and having nightmares. Like, I've, I've, had, um, I've, tried, uh, I've had nightmares in two instances in my life, uh, actually three, um, one was on MK677, another was on beta blockers, and uh, another one was on trend. So um, on growth hormone, sleep is usually amazing. Uh, you're relaxed, you're calm, uh, the sleep is very deep, um, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's completely different than, uh, than uh, you know, uh, with MK677, and that's surely pure due to the noradrenaline release. Going back to the fear and, uh, the fear and uh, anxiety thing, um, this is how things go, basically. Whenever, so, androgens in general, they are adrenergic. They, they, they stimulate both noradrenaline and adrenaline. So, like, they put us in more so in the fight or flight state. Mm-hmm. Um, when, when you're stressed, you know, your hypothalamus increases CRH, which is cortisol, uh, uh, cortisol releasing hormone and vasopressin, which is uh, the antidiuretic hormone, and then the pituitary uh, releases uh, ACTH, and then the adrenal glands uh, secrete cortisol. When cortisol is elevated, uh, the amygdala is getting activated. The the gland of the brain where you know you're start you're in a state where you're basically fearful for your life, uh, and and you're you're alert and and you're more likely to have the emotions of aggression and anxiety rather than calmness so you're not thinking with the prefrontal cortex you're thinking with the amygdala so what you're looking at from this cascade of events is basically how androgens are triggering this whole process where your your whole personality and perception of everything around you and reality is being shifted you know because they directly directly impact the nervous system as, as I was saying prior when we were talking, so the nervous system and endocrine system are, 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 are tidally linked together. So that's why, you know, again, trend sucks, but also that's why it's very important to take into consideration what's happening with our brain because we're not on cycle for three months out of the year. It's, 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 a, it's people are blasting and cruising, right? 
So this is something that's got or that's blasting, being like a lot of them are just blasting, blasting forever. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So what's happening? We're basically rearranging and changing our brain essentially as we're we're altering our hormones chronically because this is not acute changes these are chronic changes and these will have severe consequences down the road in our life and and if you're starting off when you're very young like this will for sure make you make you a different person than you would otherwise be you know unless you're actively trying to tackle these issues which really is you know goes really hand in hand with the first you know discussion we had on this podcast, you know, I really like the consistency of the of how things are, are turning out. Um, which also brings me to another point, and uh, what I'm experimenting with, um, I'm experimenting with uh, cerebral license and uh, SSRIs right now. Um, the reason why I'm doing this go, is go in, no, no, no. <sighs> like Alec, I know you're brainiac <sighs> genius. I'm just I'm just pumping the brakes so you explain okay. both compounds in a simplistic okay. way and then build okay. on it for everyone. Okay, okay. So first, uh, why SSRIs? Okay. What is an uh, SSRI? It's an antidepressant right. medication. What does it do? It's, right, right, right. Uh, so basically, they are labeled as antidepressants because they have uh, impact on people that are depressed in regards to relieving them of anxiety and depression, which I'll get, get into that uh, later on. Uh, there are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which they basically cause uh, an inhibition of the CERT uh, protein carrier transporter that uh, takes serotonin from the synapse, from the synaptic cliff and brings it back to the presynaptic neuron. So basically what happens is uh, when, when two neurons are facing forward, one is sending the transmission forward towards the receiving neuron from the ox- from the uh, neuron um, from the uh, uh, presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic neuron. Uh, the the message itself goes into the synaptic cliff when th- and then there are uh, there's a cert which is the uh, the protein carrier. It takes that message potentially and brings it back to the presynaptic neuron. And if it doesn't, it binds to the other neuron mm-hmm. and the message is delivered. So what happens is with antidepressants, they block this um, uh, this protein transporter and they basically cause accumulation of more serotonin uh, signaling to later on bind think, to the like dendritus. For, for the basic people, think of it like a neuron. dam. Like a dam is clogging up and building yeah. up the serotonin when you take an SSRI, which makes exactly. dosing them extremely problematic in my opinion. Not necessarily. So, so here's the thing, and and why why do this? So, like um, from uh, the the neurotransmitter that are excitatory, that are catecholamines, they're dopamine or adrenaline, adrenaline. They excite us. They put us in the um, in the sympathetic state. Uh, they cause vasoconstriction. They increase heart rate. Serotonin is inhibitory. Like it causes sedation. It causes calmness, collectiveness. So it's basically like a break, you know. It basically t- tells you to chill, you know, relax mm-hmm. a bit. It's not like GABA, but uh, it's completely di- different than GABA. But uh, it still it has a calming effect on the brain, and that's why it has an anxiolytic effect. But the thing that why we're uh, we're trying to take it, I mean, why we're taking it is first to balance the extreme excessive adrenergency that we're signaling from steroids. Because you cannot just shoot up your noradrenaline uh, and adrenaline and have, you know, normal baseline serotonin levels and think that you'll be calm and collective. Like, you'll be more on the edge. You'll be more uh, prone to anxiety, to depression, because you'll be more in that, you know, excitatory state. So, like, naturally, you'd want to have more. Uh, sorry, it's so hot here. Uh, so, so, you, you, so, going you, into the basics, right? You're trying to offset steroids, ruining your dopamine yeah, exactly. response, essentially. So for the audience viewing, like when you go on steroids for a long time, like your personality is going to change. Like you're going to get the super physiological drive, like the vigor, but the personality, in my opinion, if you're not catching it, can become duller and your dopamine isn't functioning normally. So Alex experiment is to use SSSRIs to combat that cascading side effect. It's not necessarily just dopamine. It's basically being more 
chill collective calm and also the good thing about ssris is that um uh, this this has been you know proven in studies they are the only uh, uh serotonin is the only neurotransmitter that directly stimulates uh neurogenesis it increases brain derived neurotrophic factor uh and it basically promotes uh uh, uh cellular uh, uh formation so like you're basically growing your brain over time so that's that's the whole concept of it and also when we're using stimulants when we're doing like stimulants like uh whether that's amphetamines whether that's uh um alpha genergic uh, drugs like uh not caffeine but i would say ephedrine for example like more dopaminergic drugs uh what happens is we have excitatory neurotoxicity which kills neurons and even drinking alcohol does that. So like when we're, when we're killing off our neurons in the brain, we are essentially uh, causing brain damage. Mm-hmm. Plus being on androgens cause that, causes that as well. So like might as well tackle this issue early on in life rather than down the road where we're going to have, you know, uh, a plethora of, um, of, uh, of problem of problems, whether that's, uh, you know, um, neurological or, you know, depression, anxiety. Mm-hmm. So, like, I'm basically being proactive in uh, addressing the issue before um, before uh, it's present- it gets presented to, uh, it, before it happens. So, uh, that's the same concept why I'm taking, like, a 5-alpha reduction inhibitor for the prostate and hair, you know. Like, you want to be proactive when you're, you know, altering things and you know for sure where damage is being occurred. So it's the same concept of you monitoring your blood pressure, your blood sugar. Like the brain is also a very important uh, aspect. Um, So that's in regards to uh, the use of SSRIs. Um, In regards to the cerebralizing, um, you know, I I actually got this from uh, Leo. Uh, He has a very good uh, in-depth video. Shout out Leo Longevity. Yeah, she has a really good video uh, in depth on cerebral lysine. Um, you know, I did some research on it later on, and you know, uh, it's basically um, enzymatically treated protein peptides uh, derived from pig brains, which is which basically directly increase brain derived neurotrophic factors and nerve gro- growth factors. So they incre- they basically heal the brain essentially, and 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 that's what they're prescribed for that's why what 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 the use of cerebralizing is it's for what's this noise yeah i'm gonna put the dog away the, one yeah. sec it'll be cut. Yeah, yeah sure no problem So I'm not well versed on cerebral license. Is that how you say it? Cerebral license, yeah. Okay. You're well versed or not well versed? Not. So explain uh, to okay, me okay. like I'm a dumb fuck. Right. So as it, so uh, as I said, like it's basically uh, enzymatically treated protein peptides extracted from pig brains. What the, the use of them is basically healing the brain by, by stimulating directly brain derived neurotrophic factors and ner- nerve growth factors so you're um, using it as they, like the cascading of like the steroids are destroying the brain yes this is exactly like your biohacking medication. yes okay. they are they are basic it is prescribed for people with um with acute brain injuries like for example a car crash uh like uh, physical trauma or even people with uh dementia and uh, alzheimer's disease because all of the uh, degradatory uh, neurological diseases like Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, dementia, uh, they are mediated through uh, neuronal death. So when, when you're losing neurons in the brain, which happens inevitably as we're, you know, um, getting older and also mediated through, you know, bad life choices, lifestyle choices, um, 
they, 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 they happen. So this is basically trying to offset neurodegeneration, and that's why it's being prescribed. And actually, uh, I talked with um, a female at a pharmacy, uh, the worker there, uh, her grandma had um, Alzheimer's, and she effectively uh, postponed the, the progression of the disease for, I think it was like a year and something, where she was like completely stable before, you know, the disease inevitably uh, caught on and, you know, she, mm -hmm. she passed away. But like she effectively, you know, had a better life for another year or so. Mm -hmm. where she was like her symptoms were significantly improving. So way better um, longevity for anyone suffering from brain deterioration. Yeah. So here's uh, the drug, yeah. Um, and uh, as far as uh, uh, safety goes, they're really not um, necessarily noted a, a lot of side effects uh, in studies, so um, n both not acute and long-term. Uh, as far as side effects, I personally have... Um, experience even though this I, I may be like an outlier because uh, people online you know are uh, not necessarily having this I have um, uh, profound diarrhea actually uh, on the days that I take it um, I do 5 ml uh, every other day uh, intravenous I started at 5 ml every day uh, Does it have which to be is intravenous? no it doesn't it can okay. be intramuscular the reason why I do it IV is because um, I really do not want to shoot 5 ml of anything intramuscularly. Right, yeah. uh, in, whenever you're shooting, even whenever you're injecting, you're increasing uh, CK creatine kinase levels, you're causing muscular damage, you're causing potentially building up scar tissue. So, like, why would I want to cause trauma in my, in my uh, muscles unnecessarily? You know, they're sore from, you know, other things. So, um, I try to avoid uh, IM administrations and also I uh, take that opportunity to also utilize, you know, vitamin C with a saline solution later on and some, you know, some uh, vitamins, uh, you know, electrolytes so to basically, you know, uh, just refresh my body and uh, I, I can get a system from the pharmacy, which is like two euros. Um, so it's dirt cheap, you know, it's not something that's really cost uh, costly. Um, and I can do it within like 10 minutes. So, um, uh, you and Macedonia pharmacies and having medical freedom to uh, pioneer this shit. Right. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we're lucky in that aspect. Um, but, uh, but so far so good in that aspect. Um, the only, and also another side effect that I, uh, do notice is that, uh, there is an intense brain fog, uh, within following 30 hours of administration. Like even right now, I'm kind of slightly dumber, um, and and also Alex, uh, slightly dumber. Everyone, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm slightly dumber. Um, and um, you know, it's medical terms like a textbook, slightly dumber. And yeah, well, I mean, it doesn't matter. The terminology is really, you know, um, it doesn't matter. It's you know more so uh, properly explaining things. So because I, I also like see some people speech, like like is it like your trouble like talking through your thought or like the thought isn't happening. Uh, the thought is it, it's hard to basically uh, grab like whenever I'm trying to access like long term data like long long term memory of like from like a year or something I read like a month or so like it's kind of like uh, like there's a brick wall so to speak okay you know so it's kind of hard to pull data um, it, it's super noticeable within you know a few hours of administration and that's speculated that uh, it's from uh, uh, simply increasing the BDNF, the brain direct neurotrophic factors. Um, a similar kind of brain fog uh, can be noted with uh, starting of the SSRIs. And uh, you mentioned uh, the dosage of SSRIs can be, uh, you know, uh, tricky. One thing that people can do if they start them is they can use utilize a non-selective lipophilic uh, beta blocker. Um, so that, that maybe such as metop metoprolol or propanolol. Uh, the reason why, you know, this may be a good idea is because uh, structurally uh, the 5-HT1A uh, autoreceptor for serotonin uh, is similar to the beta adrenergic receptors, which means that beta blockers tends, tend to block this enzyme, which causes more uh, uh, postsynaptic serotonin accumulation. So the problem with starting SSRIs there are like seven uh, uh, enzymes, uh, serotonergic enzymes, uh, 
Um, they agonize, you know, they bind to them and they agonize them. And agonizing them or inhibiting them cause, cause uh, different effects in the body. So the 5 h 2 uh, one air, it's an outer receptor. It's located, you know, in the presynaptic neuron, and it basically, when it's agon, it, when it's agonized by a, by an SSRI, uh, when it's activated, it basically lowers serotonin. So your body, it, it basically tells your your receiving neuron that there's enough serotonin, and less uh, serotonergic neurotransmission is going on. So when starting an SSRI initially, you may have an opposite effect where you're essentially having an increased anxiety and depression because you can acutely have a lesser, like a, a bigger drop in serotonergic activity simply because of this like 5 h two one When you put the roadblock in, it kind of counteracts and it's like, yo, stop. And then it yes, back yes, up again? Yes, yes, okay. yes. And what happens is SSRIs over time don't regulate this 5 h one a and that's why they increase endogenous uh, serotonin even more later on. But at first, mm-hmm. they agonize it, and it's not downregulated, and therefore they can cause acute uh, depression or enhance enhancement of the of the depression. They so, cannot cause it. Yeah, basically, what you're saying uh, is like someone who's like, "Oh, I'm depressed," goes right. to the doctor, gets an SSSRI, and then it makes it <clears throat> worse before yes. it gets better. Exactly. Okay. They can they can benefit out of using a lipophilic non-selective beta blocker. Obviously, okay. um, that's that's a trick. Um, another thing is uh, that I discussed is uh, prime use prime pixels. Yes. The good thing about prime, uh, and I'll you know note it again because I mentioned it in the previous podcast, but you know it's super long. It well, actually I got does the up, so I'll throw up the clip for someone who wants to hear your explanation. Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah. So, like, it, it, it acts as an SSRI for dopamine. Like, it downregulates the dopaminergic outer receptor, and it causes, you know, postsynaptic increase in dopamine. So, basically, over time, you'll have more dopamine. And also, because uh, dopamine agonists are, they're essentially like dopamine medics. Like, they act as dopamine at the dopaminergic receptor. So, they essentially directly increase acute dopamine, but also uh, prime uh, increases it long term by down really down regulating the data outer receptor. And another good thing about it is that it also down regulates the amygdala uh, activation. So, like even when you're in that fearful fight or flight state, mm-hmm. you're more likely to think with your prefrontal cortex rather mm-hmm. than with the amygdala. So that's what you want because. It's not necessarily being like it's not bad that you're in a fight or fight state. It's more so having fear and anxiety while you're at those stages. Like you know what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. The whole point is to even if because when you're in that state, you're extremely alert. You know you're you're you have peripheral vasoconstriction. You have blood is going into your muscles. Uh, it's pulling out from your your stomach. You you're getting more blood flow. You know in the heart in the brain. So like physically, you're more capable the problem is uh neurologically if that's overwhelming for you it can cause problems so the thing is that you want even when you're at that state you want to be uh cognitively optimized and be calm collective you know composed and that way you'll ha- you'll have rational um, um reactions to, to things to stressors mm-hmm. you know that's the reason that's the big difference where of people that are you know extremely aggressive, extremely, like, they respond, they overreact to, to, to exogenous stimuli when they're in that sympathetic state through to sheer um, uh, amygdala over, over, uh, overaction, overshooting. Mm-hmm. So that's the problem. So uh, the primate directly inhibits this um, by a statistically significant amount, and that's why I think it's a, it's a good drug and also why it's you, not... Why do you think, like... I mean, you preach on the benefits of Prammy a lot, Alec. Why do you think, like, Kaber is more, like, in the bodybuilding realm? Like, you got a prolactin issue, you deal with Kaber. Like, I only know about Prammy because I read into it. Like, everywhere you see it's Kaber, 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 Kaber. Why does Uh, Prammy have this bad rap? uh, I don't know whether it has a bad rap. I think uh, it had – I mean – the reason why it can have a bad rep uh, is because initially, whenever you're introducing anything dopaminergic, it can cause gastrointestinal uh, side effects. So people tend to complain about nausea uh, and stomach problems, and it's more enhanced from primary because it's more agonizing uh, dopaminergically. So basically, it does the, the thing that it's supposed to be doing better. 
but people associated with side effects and they, you know, they can tolerate that. Just take a lesser dose. Like Prime, you have doses uh, 0 0.6 to 5 mix. You know, you don't have to take a high dose. You know, but uh, another problem is people get it through research chemical companies and they often really fuck up the dosing. So, like, a lot of times if you overdose on them, you can, because they're measured in, you know, very small amount of milligrams, like the marginal room for error is big. And therefore, there's a you know, more uh, likelihood of, uh, of uh, misdosage and, and, uh, and side effects. So I think that's a, one reason. Another reason is uh, Kaber is a newer uh, generation drug and people, you know, want to hop on the new shit. It's more, uh, it's also the primary uh, uh, drug of choice for uh, prolactinomas, for, especially for uh, women that are, you know, that um, have um, increased uh, prolactin and uh, milk secretion even after, you know, they should stop uh, having uh, milk. And, you know, the, it also it's, I think, more uh, readily uh, available. I think it's a plethora of, of factors. But Kaber is extremely uh, toxic. It causes uh, scarring of the heart. Like, mm. it's toxic to the heart. It's cardiotoxic. Uh, and it's I wouldn't suggest, you know, chronic Kaber in use. No, you know, no way. I definitely think that played a role in Tony's issues on weakening it. <laughs> oh, for sure. For sure. I don't I mean, believe he did a little bit, you know. He's a sex no, he, addict. We all know right. he, he wants to go nuts, so. Right, right, yeah, yeah. So, um. Well, that's two that's, cutting edge experiments. I think you should honestly, like, we could put that together as separate topic videos once you conclude your experiments because I right. think you delving into the mental side of steroid abuse and finding the mitigation methods would be absolutely cutting edge for the industry when it comes to like breaking down and explaining not just like oh i got on sssris mm -hmm. like i'm just taking anti I mean, i'm just adding antidepressants on top you know like to, to, you actually to, breaking it down would give a lot of people insight to be fair i mean right now i'm not like the, the on youtube you know i'm not the leading uh, one in the industry about this you know uh, you know, Steve, I think with Leo, or, you know, have some content on that, or, or mainly Leo. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I mean, quite, quite frankly, I cannot think of anybody else uh, except uh, outside of Leo that is necessarily talking about this. Um, but, but yeah, definitely, like, why not? It, it's it's a relatively new thing in the industry, and uh, if it's uh, good and it's it's, it's responsible, uh, and it helps if it helps people, like more people should be, you know, hopping on the bandwagon. Nobody has, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 like an ownership of certain things, mm -hmm. you know. So, like. <clears throat> the more people adopt things that are good and, and help others, the better. So we're here to just spread information, do anecdotal uh, experiences as well, because there are, there are studies are lacking in every area is re related to the fitness industry. Uh, there are no studies on uh, people on uh, various forms of enhancement with uh, our lifestyle. A lot of times, a lot of the studies that are you know conducted in average people are extremely flawed due to the fact that they're not uh, as systemic and as precise uh, as and meticulous as uh, you know we are. You know we know how uh, you know how a control how a study should play out. You know they, they basically formulate a, a questionnaire. They they just answer questions, and a lot of times they either may not report report accurately through you know bad memory or straight up lying. You know when conducting studies like. You know, people apply for studies and they, you know, they just wing it. It's not necessarily that a, a lot of them, especially on nutrition, you know, um, are extremely flawed. You know, simply through through uh, statistical erroring in uh, uh, reporting the uh, the fine the the anecdotal experiences. You know, so there are a lot of things that uh, can be said about uh, anecdotal experimentation and documenting it because we're all n1 subjects like we're all subjects and right. when we post it on the internet i'm the lab know, rat. It, yeah when we're posting things on the internet it stays forever and it's basically data like it's right. it's factual anecdotal data when you sum up you know 
thousands of anecdotes, you can you can to uh, start to draw somewhat, conclusions. Yeah, you can you can be more likely uh, safer to draw this conclusions. Is a pattern. This is a pattern. What do you think about like? Like I, I saw in the mod cast, you know, James English, he was like, oh, you know, I really never noticed like androgens impacting my mood until it seems like he messed with something like DECA. Where it's okay. like when I went into enhancement, like I was like every even the tiniest amount of Austrian is going to impact my mood. Like for you with your self-experimentation with PDs, like. When did you come to the realization that these androgens are going to modulate and morph your personality in a certain way? Let me let me tell you this. It's a matter of how observative you, uh, observative you are and how how meticulous you are with doing research and uh, thinking about both both the pros and cons of things. Some things you cannot notice unless you look for them, and once you do look for them, you'd be shocked when you see them. So I'll just take a, a very superficial. Um, uh, example, hair looks, for example. Like, people in general do not notice that they're balding till they're losing uh, more than 50% of their uh, follicular hair density. Mm-hmm. I noticed when I started having hair loss when I was 16, right off, like, right off the bat. Like, I just saw it, did research, said, holy shit, this is happening. So, I was not uh, fooling myself or brushing things under the table, you know, because I'm like that, like that's my personality, and you know, uh, it's just the way that I'm. Uh, my brain works basically. So, like in, in my personality, a lot of people will, you know, not give a fuck, or they simply say, "I'm not gonna do blood work, or I'm not gonna do an AKG or an MRI. I don't want to know what's going on. It's probably bad." So, like, I'm the yeah. opposite. I'm like, I want to know everything that can happen, potentially harmful, down the road, like within the next you know, a uh, month or year or 10 years, and then try to tackle it down the road, uh, you know, preferably from the start. So like my whole mindset, that's why I'm more in tune with my body because I'm looking for these things. Mm-hmm. And the problem with um, with both lifestyle or, uh, or hormonal changes, they're not, in general, they're not a, a, a drastic uh, and acute they're bleed and they're chronic and they're not like they're not uh like straight up like night and day difference they build up and also a lot of the endocrine diseases and neurological diseases are very slow in progression and once they they basically present themselves to the point where it's noticeable by the individuals it's too late whether that's let's say acromegaly for example patients with, with acromegaly when they notice it they look at pictures from like five years ago and they're like, holy shit, my nose, my jawline is changed, my ring size, oh my god, my feet, you know. Uh, that's when they realize, uh, uh, in general, mm-hmm. that's uh, like people with uh, with uh, neurological uh, diseases, they, Parkinson disease, like they notice when they're starting shaking like this from uh, dopaminergic uh, neuronal death, basically. So when mm-hmm. they have physical manifestation, noticeable to them physical manifestations of uh, uh, and symptoms, that's when they realize but like if you were looking for them like you would notice changes really fast like Mm. i can tell i can tell basically whatever drug i'm on like i can tell it within even even a day like if Mm. if it's like like trend for example i can tell it like i can feel it kicking within hours like like for sure uh i can see side effects coming up i can see you know like I really like uh, uh, objectively judge my personality and pattern of thinking, and see if I'm deviating. So like I would look at like my porn selection, for example, like thoughts that I have random, you know, during the day, uh, you know, how I perceive um, stress, stressful situations, you know, um, how I how I sleep, you know, it's very important. Uh, that's very important as well. You know, so that that basically is very uh, important and, and uh, very quantifiable um, and um, uh, and tackable. So the reason why James, for example, is saying this is because he's not meticulous. Uh, well, not necessarily. He's not. I'm saying like he's not to the point as like you, me. Um, you know, uh, and um, 
like I, I think that's also a, a huge uh, deal due to lack of research. Like being unaware of things makes you not notice them. If you were mm-hmm. very well versed on things, research them extremely in depth, then you're more likely to 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 see things, you know. Yeah, I think that was his first experience with um, <sighs> Mandalorian, straight up. But but there are a lot of factors that come into play. And what was the testosterone dose? What el- what el- uh, ancillaries were you were being used? Like there are so many things because, as I told you, uh, different ratios of hormones impact, you know the. Uh, cognitive and neurological uh, architecture mm-hmm. uh, differently, and also we have everybody has a different baseline of hormones and also uh, uh, brain composition and neurological composition. So, you know, just moving right now, your dopamine, for example, increasing your your dopamine right now, that can make a difference uh, whether you want to hit the gym later after this podcast right. or you want to sleep. You know. Or, you know, or your serotonin, you know, would make a great difference in regards to whether you're feeling anxious, anxious right now, you know, or, or not, or talkative. So, you know, the, the, the amount of noradrenaline, you know, how it's affecting you, your blood pressure, your concentration. So, like, all of these things are basically just, you know, ongoing processes in your body that are, you know, directly influencing one another and causing cascades of events. And uh, the only way to be uh, uh, to tackle them and to be, you know, as careful as possible is just simply through research and and and, and gathering data and information, because uh, it's quite scary. Like it's fucking, uh, uh, it's it's it's, is- it's 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 screwing your body. It's messing with your body uh, on on a, on a molecular level, even. Yeah, this is like, you just put it to a T. Like, I'll have guys come in my Instagram DM box, and if you guys want to DM, our ads are down below. But, you know, they'll come to me with, like, this stack of stuff, and they have no experience with any of it individually. And then it's like, how are you supposed to give advice to someone who's just like, stack this, stack this, stack this, stack this? And, like, I'm just like, what do you want me to say? Like, I don't know what's causing what issue. Exactly. You know, I, exactly. I feel like just this education, like this, this has to become more apparent that like, yeah, like there are consequences to becoming enhanced. It is a very, very calculated biohacking game. And like, Bro, like, let's be real. Uh, sorry, sorry for interruption, but like we're so surprised people are dropping dead within, you know, the past years. Uh, you know, more people are, you know, talking about depression, anxiety, suicide attempts, all in the fitness industry. Do people think it's not tightly correlated with, you know, steroid use and androgen use and PEDs? Like, the most broken people are in the fitness industry, both fundamentally through, like, in order to pursue something to a high level, it, you have to have, like, a, an initial drive. And usually it's not, I'm going to be the best in the world. It's more so I've been bullied in school or I, I cannot get a girlfriend or, like, you know, those are the triggering points for most people to get into this. So, like, in, in essence, in the core, there are, you know, things that are not necessarily... Um, you know, they, they are slightly broken, so to speak. So they are fundamental problems. And, you know, just adding on, you know, both uh, direct and indirect uh, neurological intervention through hormones, through drug use and all that, like that's a fucking nuclear bomb waiting to happen, whether acutely or long term. And, you know, when, when you're at a point where you're so fucked, like, where do you start? Like, you're at the point where you're so fucked, you cannot even study. Like, you cannot even start to to help yourself and if you go to a doctor like they would say it's from your steroids it's from it's from lifting weights and you're you're gonna be left alone helpless and depressed and anxious and your life falling mm-hmm. apart and where to go from there you know so i'll you know, play the opposite and i'll go into my personal attempt you know no one everyone who criticized that video first off you didn't watch the video all the way through i'll say that that video is long as shit you didn't watch it all the way through the person on the other end of this camera knows exactly what I'm talking about. You didn't watch the video all the way through. But, like, I'll say, like, when I was in the mud, when I was in the gutter, like, the hormones honestly helped me get the drive to get out of it. Now, obviously, I was smart enough to go to a baseline of test and just keep everything stable, right? I wasn't, like, continuing to blast. But 
would you make the opposing argument that like if you had like super destroyed hormones that going on a baseline of constantly regulated tests would be a good option or would you stick to your angle that it's not a good road to go down at all no 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 there's a difference you were on that side of peds and then you went off and now you're at a pathological state where you need them in order to be normal that's mm-hmm. different i'm talking from a perspective of somebody not doing shit prior like a okay. natural individual where because you're natural when you're on trt like that's the difference if you okay. go off you're pathological you're not natural you're actually uh, medically sick so to speak mm-hmm. so um that's why it helps in your regard uh, but i'm just I'm saying, just saying you, like if i went sure. off during that yeah, time be, i probably would be die. talking in this camera you know? Yeah, 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 for sure. Just like yeah, I don't want, like I don't want that to be perceived of the angle of like, oh, I'm on TRT and I'm like in a really bad place in life. I'm gonna get off. Yeah, no, no. That will fucking light gasoline on the fire. And everyone yes. who fucking said that on my video that it was the roids that did that is the complete opposite. That's what pulled me out of that, and I'll stick to that till my final breaths. I think that they were saying more so in regards to what got you to that place. So, like, they are assuming that you abuse drugs to the point where, like, uh, to the point where, like, you cause neurological damage to your brain, like chronic depression and anxiety. Mm-hmm. And that's what leads you to that state, you know, because they're just making assumptions. Mm-hmm. That's not saying that TRT didn't help you out, but I'm saying. I think their angle was like drugs, androgens were, were the, the, the driving force of you being in that situation, you know, because, which is, I think people that do make those statements are people that do not follow you because, like, you've documented what you've been doing through the years. So mm. that wasn't abuse. Like, uh, I mean, you're, you're, the only stupid cycles you were doing were the enhanced bigger what was it like by the week or by yeah the, that was no, that was like that, for, um, th- that, publicity. yeah i know yeah that was basically you being an idiot but outside of that everything else that you've done has been extremely conservative and significantly less um uh, less absurd than than everybody else actually like uh uh the the, Thank the you. podcast is- you're like the only one like i'm i'm looked at like oh russo like he looks okay. like this from this okay it's just okay. like you-, you have given me the biggest cycle besides the bigger yes. by the whatever the fuck that was but like yeah. real cycle you have put me on the biggest real cycle i've ever been on so Point so blank. uh Look at, uh, uh, I'll take, uh, what was the kid name on the mockcast with Sush, the hair? James. He, okay. And okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sush, he mentioned he, he has tried uh, 700 mix of trainees, I think. Um, like that's more than whatever, like anything you've ever run in your life from an andro- uh, from a total androgenic standpoint. Like the highest I ever n- got with trainees was 400 for like a week. And then I'm like, hell no. No, no, I'm not saying just trend. Like, if you combine the total androgenic load of 700 trend and compare it to your highest cycle uh, Mm -hmm. outside of the enhanced, bigger, whatever the fuck you did, (laughs) like, that kid has taken more androgens acutely in a certain time frame than you've ever done in your life. And he's smaller than you. So, like, why is nobody saying that shit to him? Well, people do. You know, with Sush, I feel like... Okay, like, he so doesn't have, like, um, um, muscle maturity. You know, like, how, like, when your muscles get heavily and heavily, heavily trained, like, it has I, that I, density and maturity. So, at the end of the day, Sush is 6'4". So, how many people 6'4", do you know, that can fill out that frame? I want to tell you, I'm there's not, I'm not, not... I'm not saying him doing 700 trend is a smart move. It's not a smart move. I think what's really triggering to me, one of the things that's really triggering to me is the uh, wording uh, muscle maturity. So in That's layman in, 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 in layman terms, muscle maturity you're lacking muscle maturity means you're fucking small, bro. It's simple as that. The muscle gets that look when it's big enough. 
when you're big and shredded, it's gonna be detailed, grainy, and all that based on your genetic insertions and based upon your uh, uh, the body fat that you're uh, at. Okay, well, and well that's let, pretty much let, me, it. let me play against this argument. So, like, you don't agree? <sighs> like, I'm trying to conclude. Like, you don't okay. agree that like a 30 year old bodybuilder competing from the extra years of training would have more mature muscle, even if they're smaller than a bigger, younger guy. Have you seen Chris Bumstead at 18? I did. He just f sh shit on, shits on the whole uh, argument because uh, he at 18 looks like uh, everybody's daddy and uh, he looks as fucking mature as it gets even then. You know, maturity is basically being big enough and conditioned enough. Apart from that, through chronic androgenic exposure, there are things that are changed in the look as far as having more vascularity, having more uh, uh, muscle fullness, uh, having, you know, those, and, and also the, the, the skin basically quality gets uh, both positively and negatively affected through androgen uh, abuse. It, uh, it uh, loses collagen and it's kind of more synced in, you know, that uh, paper thin, dry, yeah. sucked in uh, skin. Like, that's basically through damage to the collagen. Like, basically, you know, old people that have sagging skin, not mm. sagging skin, but, you know, the thinner skin, you know, it's mm. the old man uh, look, and they're veiny and all that. Like, people are getting that through 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 uh, uh, chronic androgen abuse, and they're basically aging themselves faster. Mm -hmm. And it just happens to be in line with the bodybuilding goals of having, you know, thinner skin on the, sca on the stage. And it benefits their appearance in that aspect, but that's not something that they they should cheer for and be happy about. It's actually them fucking healing themselves faster. So that's the thing. And um, as far as also um, you know, uh, maturity, like I, I I hate things that cannot be uh, that cannot be uh, uh, summarized in, in in a sentence. For example, like what is maturity? Like if you cannot objectively you know uh, explain to me and the mechanisms of how that uh, is being you know uh formulated and how it looks and what it presents and you know from a from the logical standpoint to me it does not exist i would explain it in the way of like when you first start training you have virgin muscles you make those virgin gains and then over the years of training if you stay consistent the muscle gets denser, more mature looking, appears visually. You can make the argument that that's from the collagen deterioration. But like, for example, like, do you think that since I have muscle memory and like I can get back to my mature look faster yes. than someone who just but, but, started training now who could technically be bigger than me? But that mature look that you're getting back to faster is still correlated with you gaining back size. So like it's still a metric of size. It's like it's not it's not all things equal, you're just more mature. It's always you being better overall from a bodybuilding standpoint. You're either leaner or bigger or both, which adds mm -hmm. up to that look. So again, it's back to the premise of, you know, it's basically being uh, you being a tissue. more yeah, just more muscle tissue and more condition. Simple as that. And also another thing is when, when the more you do shows, the more you compete or the more you get shredded, the easier it is to both hold a, a good amount of conditioning and also get to you know uh, uh, the appropriate conditioning, which will make you look better in regards to whenever you're gaining more muscle mass later on each bulking phase, you'll be at a leaner body fat and you'll always look more impressive and therefore say, I, now I have muscle maturity. When in reality, you're just big enough and lean enough constant, or throughout, you know, constantly because you're at that stage where you're just good and you look better, you know. So it's always, it has some, it, it has to have some backing on how things are occurring. We cannot, we cannot just say things are happening without actually looking into how they're actually happening. If there is no actual explanation for things, it's probably not happening. Okay, I feel like my arguments depend on that. I think that's a good caveat going into like, I'm more excited for you to reverse me out of this first show than I am actually doing the first show. 
Like I'm more interested in like the second show look after you've like, okay, I figured Russo out and you right. did like the first initial shred where I have all this garbage fat on me and then the second reverse down will be cleaner. Like for people sure. who are aspiring to compete, I see a lot of people give up on the first show when when I follow people's careers, it's normally like the third, second, third, fourth show where that physique really comes together after some trial and error. What's your thoughts on that? Well, let me give you a, a realistic uh, viewpoint. This will include me. This will uh, include you. Um, realistically speaking, we're still small. Like we're small. You're small. I'm small mm-hmm. from a bodybuilding perspective. When I got super shredded, like 3% body fat, I was 184, 185 kilos which is like one uh, in pounds, like 192. Yeah. Or, okay, so, yeah, I uh, looked great in pictures and everything and uh, videos. Uh, in clothes, I look natural. At uh, my height, six one and a half, almost 6'2", like I have to be 235 shredded to, to that, you know, body fat in order to look, you know, like a bodybuilder. The same thing applies for you as well because you're not that far off uh, height wise uh, versus me. So, like, in order for you to actually be like, fuck, this dude is competitive and, uh, you know, like a, like a really good bodybuilder, like, you need so much more mass, you know, mm-hmm. and that's pretty much the reality of it. And uh, realistically speaking, neither you nor I have uh, uh, genetics that uh, a lot of these other people have, like, even the, the, the people on the podcast, James English, you know, um, even that D-Trend t- dude, um, like the people in general in the fitness industry that we see are those that have gr- great genetics. Like mm-hmm. that's why their their eyes are on them. When I got my motivation for getting that shredded years ago was because I'm not gen- genetically gifted. Uh, you know, I'm naturally fat and small. I, I gain muscle uh, hard and I gain fat easily. And I said, I cannot compete with people even if I start juicing right now. So I will get as shredded as possible because that va- variable is controllable by me and me alone. And that's why I played that card. But like having been there, like I have no intentions into getting that shredded again unless it has a purpose and unless, uh, you know, I can capitalize in, on, on that. And um, like I still have a way long way to go. Like I, I assume like I have like more like five to seven years of actual muscle growth before I even think about being competitive. I mean, by competitive, I, I mean, I can win any local show here. That's not a, the, 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 the point. When I, when I, you know, say that I'm prepping for a show and let's say I'm going to cl- the classic or bodybuilding, whatever, like the picture in my mind that I have is from pros. Because like I aspire to be, you know, the, you know, to the ranks of pros, because we're doing the same shit. We're even more meticulous in regards to, you know, how things work and everything. Most of them are absolute idiots. We are just genetically blessed. And, you know, like, we're doing everything impossible we can, putting 100%. And, like, when you imagine yourself on stage, like, I don't imagine a, a, a skinny, lanky, you know, shredded dude. Like, I want to be bummed that if I'm on stage, you know, mm. if I cannot do that, then that's not for me. And I'll just accept the reality of it, you know. Uh, so, so that's my, my, my concept of it. Like, uh, I, I want you to do this show and all that just because you haven't cut in a, in a long time. Uh, people are shitting on you that, uh, you know, you cannot get shredded, you're fat, this and that. So, like, it's more so to say fuck you to people that are, you know, talking shit about you. Uh, and also, it would benefit you in the growth phase later on. Mm-hmm. But afterwards, I would not do shows or you know pursue competing or things like that. Like I would focus on business, researching, uh, you know, uh, improving people's lives, you know, putting on content while uh, you know doing the whole bodybuilding lifestyle, gaining muscle and all that, and have like a sheer progression, progression in a positive aspect, rather than getting caught up in something that objectively speaking, you're not destined for neither am I. Like, we're not going to be ever in the Olympia. We don't have the genetics. You know, it is what it is. But that does not mean that, you know, we cannot look amazing. You know, we cannot be super strong. You know, we cannot be cognitively super sharp. You know, we can we cannot make money or help people. Like, that, that doesn't matter, you know. So, 
that's 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 simply how I look at things. That's why I never did a show. Like I was, I was, uh, I went to a show locally when I was like thirty percent body fat, and I if I, I just needed to walk on the stage and just win if I wanted to. Like there was no competition, <laughs> and mm-hmm. when people saw me, like they were like, "Holy shit." Why aren't you competing? I'm like, I don't see a point in it. Like, even if I were to do that and post pictures on, on, from the stage, you know, how would I call myself a champion if I'm going up against, you know, people that are, you know, very embarrassingly bad? Like, mm-hmm. I wouldn't feel like a like a champion. I would actually feel like a chump. So, uh, you know, that's, that's how I look at things. Uh, that's how I look at your prep. I really want you to see, you know, uh, you aesthetic, shredded you know, um, uh, healthy, you know, and, 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 you know, just on an upswing on uh, basically pull that slim shock bad for an upswing later on. So that's how I see the, uh, your, your whole prep. And also like you uh, doing well, obviously in your weight category, because again, it's based off of a uh, height and weight. So like, you're not going to go against, uh, you know, a Rian Grimes or someone like that, but like from a, from a, a critical uh, viewpoint, you know, I'd like to see more muscle mass, obviously, in, mm. uh, on you. And, I mean, you're not stupid. Like, you know this, you know. Mm. Like, and I've never seen you say, oh, I'm, you know, so fucking amazing. Fuck you all, you know. Mm. I'm this and that, you know. Like My whole uh, thing has been about <laughs> defying my genetics through biohacking. And, like, my aspirations as far as the competing is just to earn a pro card, and that's that, you know. That would be my end, end goal is – earn a pro card and that is that no when you yeah, when you go no, the into the um bumstead right do you right. attribute bumsteads like because like when i do the timeline of bumstead like i'm logical you are logical right. we will never catch him never catch him never catch him but like when you go into like his timeline is it because he started at such a young age. He had such yes. a pedigree at a young age, and pretty much that makes the argument that unless you start at that age with a pedigree family or someone who really knows what they're doing, like good luck making it to the top unless you're a genetic super freak. Here's the thing. I think it's a combination of both having amazing genetics, having the right influence, the um, proper drug response, and I think Bumstead has like I, I don't like I'll get backlash for this, but I think he has burned himself early on, uh, and that's also a, a huge contributing factor I think to his autoimmune disease has been uh, the androgen abuse from early early on in his life because uh, androgens directly um, increase systemic inflammation, they increase inflammatory cytokines. They, they trigger an autoimmune response. They also directly uh, are associated with, uh, with uh, kidney damage. So, like, they're basically nephrotoxic. Just, just, just as if they're hypertrophing the heart, they're directly nephrotoxic. Mm-hmm. And coincidentally, his autoimmune disease is Berger syndrome, which is uh, it's, it's attacking the kidneys. So, mm-hmm. like, it's a nephrological. And if you look at his shows, like, he beat he uh, he beat Regan Grimes in an open show. I think that's when he got his uh, pro card. Like he beat Regan Grimes, mm-hmm. and he he looked jacked out of his fucking mind. At like 18, 19, he was deadlifting like seven plates. He was doing like the fucking craziest shit uh, early on, and he mm-hmm. looked like everybody's uncle while he was in high school. Mm-hmm. And uh, and and uh, let's be real, you know, like. I've seen pictures of Jay Cutler at 16, uh, Lee Priest at 14, you know, all, obviously jacked and everything. But the pictures that I see of Bumstead when he's like, you know, super young at 18, 19, you know, he has the androgenic look in his delts, does, in his yeah. traps. Like he has that signature steroid look. Whereas like Lee Priest at 14 or Jay Cutler at 16, where he's fucking, he's even bigger than Bumstead. Uh, and those yeah, pictures. Jay has that like natural yeah, farmer yeah. boy look. Like, yeah, that's a yeah, big yeah, ass exactly. farmer boy. Yeah, he looks like he can fucking flip a truck, mm. and like he's not fat. Like those pictures, uh, you know. But you can t- like, there. There's no three D delts. He's not capped. Like there's no bulging traps. There's no vascularity. You know, the enhanced vascularity in arms and delts. Like the, the pictures, and there's no guy. No, you know. 
and the pictures, the the controversial pictures of Chris, were, you know, when where you know he said, uh, yeah, he posted uh, that natty pic, and it's just right. like I feel like, like that's <laughs> where he was like kind of natty. Mm, no, he was. He, he's. He, he, I'm like. If I have to bet, like, I'm not gonna insinuate things without you know. I'll, if I have to bet, like, bet money on it, I would say he was not natural. Uh, and I actually think that uh, just gauging by his look, if you take the back uh, progress away, like, just because he made an insane difference in his back, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the uh, previous two Olympias. But if you take the back away, he has been looking more or less the same. Ever since he went pro, mm-hmm. up until today, his arms, his delts, like uh, his arms are obviously improved right now. But it's still, like it's if he has that amazing genetics early on and looks like a fucking freak of nature, like he'd be he'd be like an open pro, like he'd be the next Ronnie if right. he was naturally looking like that. I think he just kept early on maximized his genetic potential and his not genetic potential but i'm saying his structure and his like easy growth at first you know he capitalizes on that then the classes uh, the classic physique you know uh shows up and then he just basically uh you know well, does Bumstead, what he does Bumstead also claims to have never used um <sighs> growth hormone or insulin which I obviously mean, regan grimes is with mr insulin Milos himself so do you uh, think that plays a role that Bumstead stayed away from some of the other peds to maintain what? aesthetics as far as no. growth hormone and insulin? No, because Regan Grimes is aesthetic as fuck. Like he hasn't lost his aesthetics at all. Regan mm-hmm. is just simply the, you cannot gain muscle disproportionate to like extremely disproportionate to your uh, waistline. Like even Chris has a bigger waistline than when he was uh, seventeen. Like, there's no way you can, like, as you get bigger, so will the waistline. It's just a matter of that right now, he has the right proportions for the class that he's uh, being representative of. Uh, so it's simply a matter of genetics and, you know, how the cards, you know, were having laid out for him. Simple as that. Otherwise, you know, Regan has a very small uh, waist. Even Milos had a very great taper and small waist. So... I wouldn't say that, you know, uh, Chris is avoiding insulin or growth hormone or maybe he is, maybe he he isn't. Uh, It's funny um, because, like, you cannot see, look at somebody and say, oh, he's on insulin. Like, these drugs do do not have that um, uh, enhanced and profound effect, uh, uh, visual, where you can just tell. You know, mm-hmm. like I, I, I see uh, uh, Greg just said uh, being uh, accused by various YouTubers um, guessing like that he is, uh, you know, uh, on that amount of growth hormone. Like Boston Lloyd used to uh, talk about this, uh, you know, just by looking at somebody like mm, you cannot tell if somebody is like on, on uh, you know, two or three years of growth hormone or no growth hormone or like like you can tell if somebody's on androgens but like for growth hormone and insulin unless we're talking high doses because high doses of growth hormone give a very distinct signature look in fullness like they give uh, growth hormone gives a, a, an intracellular uh, a volumization effect more so than any steroid like if you were to shoot like 10 hours of growth hormone but outside of that like you cannot look at somebody and say oh based upon this picture he must be on two hours of growth like mm-hmm. uh, you cannot say that like it's it's pretty retarded and 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 and, 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 and like the only way responsible. you could spot the gh insulin look would be like <sighs> when you look at like an extreme example in my opinion of like rolly off season or Rammy off season when you can tell they're like super carb loaded. Here's the thing though, uh, insulin is getting demonized, you know, in the industry, and in fact, there's nothing really miraculous as far as like it's not ruining anybody, it's not really necessarily doing anything harmful. The reason why big dudes need insulin, there are two reasons. First of all, for initially they're using growth hormone which blocks insulin uh, insulin's effect at the receptor site. So basically it causes acute direct insulin resistance. What coped with a high caloric intake with the majority of the calories coming from carbs, because they're not going to bulk on a keto diet, 
that basically le- would lead to an inevitable insulin resistance. Mm-hmm. What happens then is that uh, pancreatic beta uh, cells die off and you become mm-hmm. fucking diabetic. So in order to prevent this, you have to use insulin. Mm-hmm. Like they're using insulin not necessarily to fucking do something uh, and grow, you know, more of their physique or whatever. Like yeah, they have Greg to. Yeah, is like fear mongering. Like Greg Doucette is full when, of like, shit. With ten year olds uh, who are diabetic their whole life, he's insulin. So uh, Greg, I don't, I don't like. He has g- g- good information on certain things, and he's just blatantly wrong, completely wrong on other things. Like the insulin fear Morgan is absolutely retarded. Actually, growth hormone causes more damage than insulin. Uh, uh, Especially because, growth hormone without insulin, like how you mentioned. Yeah, exactly. Like your pancreas it's, is just going to die if you ignore it. So, so, so acromegaly patients, which is a, a, an endocrine pituitary disease where you have a, a adenoma in your brain that, uh, you know, causes uh, abnormal uh, secretion of uh, growth hormone and uh, consequently IGF-1. Uh, acromegaly patients, uh, if not if left untreated, die you know before they're thirty, and they die off of, from uh, pituitary failure. Basically, they develop insulin resistance. Their thyroid goes to shit. Their adrenal glands give out. When you're diabetic, everything goes to shit, and you know you basically die off. So, like, insulin doesn't do that. Like, insulin does not kill you. Uh, growth hormone can, both directly and indirectly, uh, uh, plus uh, uh, IGF one. Uh, you know, is directly correlated to uh, shortening of the lifespan since uh, our our molecules have a certain set uh, set point in how 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 much they can divide. Once they reach a certain point where they cannot continue to divide, they go to uh, apoptosis, which is cellular death, and that's it. So when you're causing hyperplasia, you're uh, accelerating your uh, you know uh, your uh, rate of uh, of aging essentially and heading towards apoptosis and also IGF-1 stimulates uh, you know the enter growth pathway which co- consequently does not leave enough room for adenosine monophosphate protein kinase the MPK pathway to uh, be triggered and for you to be in uh, autophagy uh, autophagy cellular repair mode and if you're constantly in that growth f- uh, phase, you're essentially, again, shortening your lifespan and potentially, uh, you know, can uh, develop uh, tumors and cancers. And if you've noticed in a lot of, um, uh, uh, not biopsies, but uh, um, autopsies that we've Thyroid seen. Cancer. on Not only that, like people have, like they have tumors, like Andres Muser had on his liver, Dallas had on his thyroid. Um, you know, I cannot, you know, uh, think them uh, right off the, the back of my mind, but almost like every other uh, uh, autopsy that I've seen from my view pros, they have some form of tumor, you know. Mm-hmm. So that's both mediated through androgen use and through growth hormone use. With insulin, you don't get that. Like people on insulin live really, you know, they, they don't fucking face repercussions out of it, they face repercussions if they do not use it or use it incorrectly. And by incorrectly, I mean they underdose it. Overdosing insulin, unless you're diabetic, like what happens, like even I mentioned with this with uh, Tony, like the suicide rates of with, with insulin is so low, like people that try to kill themselves through inducing a hypoglycemic coma and, and, and killing themselves have failed because they entered the coma and uh, glucagon gets secreted, which is uh, a hormone produced by the alpha cells in the pancreas. It causes glycogenolysis, which breaks down glycogen into glucose, or gluconeogenesis, which breaks down aminos into mm-hmm. uh, glucose. It raises blood sugar and basically saves you from pulls you out of it. From being, yeah, it pulls you out of it. So, so here's a funny the, story that goes on uh, um, your play. Before you go, go on, that's why a lot of bodybuilders that are on podcasts on, 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 on you know, that I've seen, like even on Eric's Muscle and what, when they tell scary insulin stories, a lot of them are either blatantly lying or they just get so um, so uh, uh, scared of the because the, the feeling of going high is, you know, uh, noradrenaline gets secreted, you're sweating, you're you know, you're extremely agitated and you have increased heart rate and you're anxious. And you feel like you're gonna die, and that's why they perceive it as, oh, this fucking, uh, you know, life or death situation happened to me because of insulin. When in reality, it was just their nervous mm-hmm. system being, you know, overly stimulated. There is a thing if you were to use a, a beta blocker. There's a, a, a condition called um, 
um, it was like a, a hypoglycemic um, unawareness induced by beta blockers, where if you use beta blockers and insulin and go hypo, because you're going to block the beta adrenergic signaling in your heart, you wouldn't get the, the increased heart rate and consequently uh, anxiety of it. And people tend to you know, almost faint when pairing insulin and beta blockers because they don't feel going hypo. Because it's, it's going to prevent the nervous system overreaction. I did that on mushrooms. You know? I did that on mushrooms. You know? I passed out on mushrooms through that exact thing. You see? So mm -hmm. that's the thing. It's simply the nervous system. But people that have no idea how the nervous system works, haven't studied you know, anything about that, or even the drugs themselves, you know, they just say, oh, my God, I was about to die. I was cold. I was sweating. You know? Oh my God, you know, insulin is the devil, you know, you can kill yourself with it, when in reality is completely the opposite, you know, and it's, I had to bring it up because like people have been tearing, you know, uh, insulin stories online for like decades, you know, bodybuilders, uh, and then they're always so absurd and crazy stories, like they shot for use and they forgot their, I don't know, their snacks in the parking lot or whatever, you know, and they were like, you know, almost so about let's go, to die. Let's, let's go into my crazy story. So this this goes back to your favorite steroid cycle I ever did, which is the one week, you know, bullshit oh my blast. God. I'll call it the bullshit blast. But anyways, yeah. I was so delirious on all that GH that I was supposed to be doing, um, I believe, 10 units of insulin to offset. And I was measuring out insulin when I thought I was measuring out another peptide I was doing. And I injected myself with 50 units of insulin, mm -hmm. right? right? I'm like, oh, man, I don't want this. To well, I didn't think I was going to die. I thought like, right. oh, I'm going to go to the hospital and they're going to put this on the fucking documentary. And like it's going to be clown Russo, right? So I right. put my poker face on. And I'm like, I'm going to ride out 50 units of insulin. And, yeah, I wrote it out, right? I was just redlining the whole time. But I knew that I wasn't in inherent danger and that Correct. they could revive me. I just didn't want to be labeled as that guy on the video. Right. right. You know, I see. So I made it a clickbait video. But at the same time, there are like 12-year-olds, 10-year-olds who are taught how to use insulin because they have to use insulin. And I don't know, the danger to me, it's like, why would you not want to, you know, offset pancreas death? Insulin right. is offsetting pancreas death. Not only that, um, it's also, uh, it increases IGF-1. So if we're talking from a growth uh, uh, stimulating pathway uh, perspective, uh there are in actually all insulin is not uh, created equal so like in studies there are certain insulins that have signature effects for them in particular so for for example levomir uh, which is a basal insulin actually causes decrease in appetite versus something that like uh, lantus for example that actually increases uh, appetite and promotes weight gain as far as uh, uh, igf1 signaling lantus has the most amount of IGF-1 um, affinity. Um, I didn't know if, So this is new yeah. to me. Uh, it has the most, like, and it's like, uh, I cannot remember off the top of my head how many times, but it's like it was really significantly uh, uh, more affinity for uh, IGF-1 uh, uh, creation. So uh, uh, Lantus would be the ideal uh, in basal insulin for, uh, uh, in a bulking context. Uh, especially paired with growth hormone in regards to maximizing uh, IGF-1 response. So, um, and also insulin is not bioidentical. Like the insulin that we're shooting, I mean, I'm not using insulin, but like the bodybuilders are shooting, it's not uh, the exact same insulin uh, as uh, we endogenously produce. That's why it has a different effect uh, on a cellular level. So, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not, you know, a, a one size fits all. Uh, that's why, you know, I think rapid insulin is really stupid to be realized, uh, unless in certain situations, like where uh, you're yeah, either the high. would be rapid ins insulin? Yes, yes, no yeah. rapid. So, like, I think that's stupid uh, unless you're trying to make weight and then carb up really fast, or you're extremely dehydrated. So, like, for example, if you pass out uh, from uh, extreme dehydration, 
or you have cramps or you have um, uh, hyperkalemia, like they would do, give you IV insulin and glucose in order for insulin to shuttle, you know, things into your cells. And so you can be like uh, basically uh, in, a, in a fresh baseline where you're not going to have like an uh, electrolyte disbalance or, you know, an, an, or an, that could cause consequently an arrhythmia or something like that. Like insulin, rapid insulin is given for, for situations where rapid action needs to be taken place. And it's usually in the context of uh, rehydration, you know, uh, mitigating, uh, you know, maybe some shit. Like people, when they uh, take potassium uh, aspirant diuretics and they load on potassium and like they get cramps and they're, they can, you know, fucking die. Uh, and uh, like, unless you tell in the hospital what you did, like they would give you IV electrolytes with potassium and that can stop your heart. But like, if you were to tell them what you've done, they would give you IV uh, insulin in order to shut the uh, shuttle that a uh, uh, serum excess potassium that you have uh, intracellularly uh, and and basically save you. So uh, uh, if you want, from a bodybuilder uh, perspective, to um, optimally utilize insulin, you'd want to use a basal one, preferably uh, lentus, in the context of uh, gaining muscle. Um, and bulking and if you're in a context of cutting and you're using growth hormone uh, I would advise against using insulin simply because of the fact that um, there are studies where they uh, injected both growth hormone and insulin simultaneously and insulin was effective at uh, shutting off uh, the fat lipolysis the, fat, the lipolytic effect of growth hormone uh, acutely so basically pairing them together uh, from a fat loss perspective uh, is uh, counterintuitive, um, yeah. unless you unless you really have to, and like your insulin resistance is absolute shit. But if it's shit while you're cutting, then uh, you have other un, uh, underlying issues that right. need to be addressed. So uh, that's that's uh, that's pretty much it in that regard. And also, I will uh, suggest uh, optimizing insulin sensitivity, since it's not just a matter of um, having insulin present; it's a matter of how effective it is. Uh, doing its job. If you have insulin resistance, you're essentially not responding to the amount of insulin as you should be. So, like, for example, uh, I've done this experiment. Like, if I were to take insulin, rapid insulin, for example, like I would take, like, four IUs, for example, right? I would start getting feeling hypo really fast, and I would need approximately, like, 30, uh, 30 grams of carbs to 50 in order to, you know, not go into that hypoglycemic state. Mm. If I were to shoot five units of growth hormone and uh, uh, my blood sugar would grow, would go up, obviously, and I would need approximately 15 units, 15 units okay. of rapid insulin without eating anything to have my blood sugar normal. Like that's how big of a deal it, 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 uh, uh, and how big of um, insulin resistance growth hormone can um, can impose. So like four I use, I require for 30 to 50 uh, uh, grams of carbs versus, versus 15 I use in order to be normal on five I use of growth hormone. So like that's how fucking insulin resistant it can make you assuming you have legitimate growth hormone. So using, you know, doses up to like 15 units, 20 units that the uh, pros are doing, uh, you know, that would mandate insulin use and also GDAs, glucose disposal engines. That's why also having your protocol, we will uh, uh, utilize. Um, so as far as like uh, glucose uh, 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 you know, regulation, you're cutting, you're uh, doing cardio, uh, which I'll increase your cardio in a bit. Uh, you're basically doing everything in order to, you know, uh, optimize insulin sensitivity from a lifestyle perspective. But you're also on growth hormone, so uh, we'll also utilize um, uh, barberin. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Barberin. Uh, the reason why I choose barberin, um, you know, like I just like metformin just because of the sheer effect, direct effects on uh, IGF one. Even though they're not really statistically significant, you know, that would warrant, you know, you being worried. But like uh, bourbon, for example, it's a great uh, longevity supplement because uh, it activates that uh, adenosine monophosphate protein kinase pathway, uh, which will uh, you know put you in a more you know cellular repair mode uh, and also improve um, uh, insulin sensitivity. I also uh, you know told you to get on the 
uh, Jardins, uh, uh, the drug that's a member of the glyphosin family, mm -hmm. which is a sodium glucose CO2 protein transporter inhibitor. Uh, what it does is basically uh, increases uh, urinary sodium and, uh, and glucose excretion, uh, which also uh, will help you with uh, blood pressure management and also it's given for uh, people with uh, hypertension and uh, heart failure and also direct it directly improves heart function. Uh, and and that's a statistically uh, significant. So it's very important to note when things are doing statistically significant changes, those are quantifiable. Like those are, you know, night and day differences. Um, and, not, and also it will increase in your glucose excretion. So therefore your uh, blood sugar will be more tightly regulated and you would, you know, be in a more uh, uh, nutrient uh, uh, you would be in a more uh, uh, insulin, uh, better insulin sensitivity uh, uh, state. Uh, so insulin, uh, so uh, nutrient partitioning would be better. Um, another thing that uh, will also uh, be utilizing as far as uh, uh, your um, uh, insulin goes, basically, would be will add some cardarin. Um, even though it's it's a PPR delta agonist, it, it doesn't have uh, you know a, a very profound effect on, on, on glucose. But it has uh, a great effect on, you know, cellular energy uh, formation, mm. uh, and it also will uh, play um, alongside you doing, you know, the cardio, and it will give you endurance, and especially when we we'll, uh, get you on, on on a low dose of trend, you know, in order to uh, try to offset some of the direct uh, cardio negative uh, cardiovascular um, uh, performance uh, side effects, you know, um, negative side effects that the trend uh, imposes. Um, what else was it? Uh, uh, in regards to your your protocol, uh, might as well mention the the slight alternations that we'll have. Um, we're also implementing uh, azitamide uh, at ten milligrams per day. Uh, that's basically for uh, cholesterol um, improval. Um, we're we're gonna lay off, you know, uh, and postpone statin use, uh, and preferably not use them uh, unless you know absolutely necessary. Uh, azitamide is more so like a freebie drug that uh, uh, it's it's not uh, it's not gonna have any side effects, no other side effects, or make you dependent on it. Um, it simply blocks um, uh, protein transporter NPC one L one that carries uh, cholesterol for, from the small intestines into the liver, thereby forcing the liver to pull more uh, cholesterol from the serum and, and uh, by doing so, decreasing the uh, total amount of cholesterol in your, uh, in your serum. Uh, and it has a great effect on, um, uh, on LDL. So um, that's basically from um, uh, ancillary uh, standpoint. You know, do you want me to mention, you know, other supplements that you're on? Because there was a question about uh, supplement use. Yeah, let's do that. So break down. Here, I'll pull it up. No, I, I I can pull it up. Go into all the ancillary vitamins, and then I guess we'll wrap this podcast up with blood pressure mitigation. Okay, one sec. <clears throat> Uh, okay, so you're realizing uh, omega-3 is a supplement. Um, I mean, that's just basically a uh, no-brainer. Uh, you're having a higher omega-3 uh, uh, diet, basically, uh, is uh, crucial for um, mitigating systemic inflammation because having elevated... Because uh, androgens themselves increase systemic inflammation, uh, which can uh, cause, you know, a, a cascade of problems. And also neurologically negatively affect you because uh, uh, in the presence of uh, inflammation, uh, L-tryptophan, which is a precursor to serotonin, gets downregulated. Um, so basically, uh, you'll be more likely to uh, be to feel you know more down and more depressed. Mm -hmm. um, in regards to, you have then uh, vitamin K2 and K1. Uh, the vitamin K2 um, increases uh, matrix GLA protein stimulation. Uh, which essentially clears the arteries from uh, calcium deposits, and K1 increases. And that's uh, my also, big issue on the blood work for everyone. Right, right. You haven't watched uh, that video. Right, and osteocalcin, which K1, which uh, stimulates osteocalcin, basically binds uh, calcium back to the bones, so it does not get uh, you know 
uh, released by the parathyroid hormone uh, into the serum, which again is uh, 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 something that was you know uh, problematic for you on the last blood work that you you will repeat and we'll see you know whether there's a parathyroid over um, or activation or it was just like a, a fluke. Uh, then you have uh, vitamin D supplementation. Again, this is in the context of uh, you know man managing um, uh, calcium absorption, uh, you know immunomodulation, um, and you know overall you know vitamin D is uh, is actually a hormone. So um, we're not you know going super crazy with it. You know just two thousand IUs until I see on blood work where you're uh, actually at this dose may go uh, up until you know even five to six thousand depending on how much you actually need you know i see people really overdosing on it like they take up to two thousand ten thousand i use but like without actually like uh having blood work done and knowing your numbers like you can <laughs> you can uh, also cause uh toxicity so it's not a matter of just you know uh, abusing it uh you have a uh, neck uh, and uh, ATKA or TATKA, uh, it's simply uh, for liver support and uh, anti-inflammation. Uh, you have magnesium, uh, um, magnesium, zinc, vitamin C, vitamin C obviously for antioxidant, uh, antioxidant purposes, and also for the blood vessels, magnesium, uh, you know, for cramping, uh, uh, RAS system uh, management, so it also uh, has a positive effect on, on uh, blood pressure. Zinc will also have, like, they have a variety of uh, of uh, positive effects. Like, if I were to, you know, just talk about each one, like, it should be like a, a fucking uh, a podcast for each individual uh, right. vitamin. So, uh, and also you have, uh, holy shit, it's so hot in here. Um, Open you, the window. Uh, you know the window. Okay. Uh, uh, does it have a lot of background noise? No, you're good. Okay, and um, we have also uh, baking soda, uh, five grams, two or three times per day. I actually picked this up from Ian Valer. Thank you, Ian. He sent me uh, Chris Bumstead's uh, uh, protocol for uh, his management of his autoimmune disease. Um, so um, the whole idea is to lower uh, the body's acidity. Um, so that's why, you know, um, baking soda is being utilized. Um, and I, I have this in your protocol now. I don't know, um, since you're slightly hypertensive, maybe we'll cut back on this one. Actually, uh, I would suggest for you to cut it just so we can see whether uh, you have acute relief uh, in regards to uh, uh, your blood pressure. Um, and that's pretty much it, like supplement wise. I mentioned, uh, you know, prior I talked about the other things. So, that would you we're recommend on. that to anyone on cycle? As far as like, is this especially Who? because I'm blasting, or would you? Uh, I would. I would recommend because like, people are going to cookie cutter this protocol the minute we post this clip video, you know. Oh, and also there are citrus bergamot and carditon. Yeah, actually, I would. I would. Uh, I have no problems with people cookie cutting uh, and and just copy pasting this. Um, you know, it, it cannot I'll put cause the dosages harm. and everything in the description below because this will be like its own clip video. Okay, so like this, uh, this wouldn't be you know counterintuitive to, to uh, towards anybody and, and their protocol. So, uh, you know, I see no problems with them. You know, just copying this. All right, last topic because Alec is roasting in this room. He's a sauna. Right. Man. So. Yeah. Everyone is begging you, Alec, to do, I guess, I'll call this video clip of the podcast, Blood Pressure Management 101 for Enhanced Lifters, right? So I guess start with, you know, the first method of attack to the most extreme methods of attack in the most basic way for a monkey brain to understand. We don't need the, well, this is going through this receptor, this receptor, Simplify okay. that down into something that's very easy to inhale for someone to implement. Okay, so in general, first we need to ask ourselves, why is the blood pressure being elevated? So, like, realistically speaking, when we're utilizing, you know, PEDs, one of the mechanisms where blood pressure gets elevated is through sodium retention. So, like, you'd first want to avoid drugs that are highly sodium retensive that impact the raw system greatly so 
you know, things like D-ball, uh, you know, high doses of tests, high aromatizing drugs, and so forth. Uh, now I'm talking about how to not get it, and then, you know, I'll talk about... And you, you want to be management. eating cleaner if you're enhanced, right? No garbage. Absolutely. You know, people are still eating like a natural when they go enhanced. Right. You got to fucking stop that. Yeah, because they're using them, uh, they're using enhancement as a way of cheating on their diet, where in reality, the repercussions of a bad diet is enhanced by enhancements. So, you know, Tony's, I'm accusing Tony of doing this, you know, this is a call. He admits he's doing it. Yeah, well, again, I'm I'm taking shots at him right now. <laughs> but, um, uh, no, we're all good. Now, second thing is, uh, you know, Avoiding high androgenic compounds. So one way, as it said, androgens directly impact uh, uh, our blood pressure through increasement of noradrenaline and adrenaline. They put us in the sympathetic state. So harsh androgens like halotestin, uh, trembolone, uh, you know, uh, anadrol, superdrol, like those things will just surely through neurotransmission, uh, uh, through basically adrenergic stimulation, will mm. uh, will. It elevate uh, uh, blood pressures outside of the raw system, uh, you know, activation. Because they're like trend, for example, is not notorious for causing water tension, but it's very notorious for increasing blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So, like that's through the adrenergic pathway. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, we have to see another uh, uh, way of uh, increasing uh, uh, how androgens increase blood pressure is through increasing blood viscosity. So, like. Mm -hmm. That's basically thinking of the blood mediated through um, uh, inducing polycythemia. So, like androgens directly stimulate EPO production from the kidneys, and also they signal the bone marrow directly into producing more red blood, cell uh, blood cells. So, this is he heavily individual, and, and you know some people are more prone to this, some are less. Uh, in this situation, uh, uh, blood work is warranted, uh, and. Some people are more prone to getting the side effects out of certain androgens, so avoid those. Uh, and if the issue do, does arise, then uh, utilize something. Um, having an ARB uh, in this situation and also like um, a blood okay, thinner. Okay, don't abbreviate ARB. What does ARB mean? An intensity receptor blocker. Um, such those as, are, you know, someone's taking such notes as, on this video. Su such as Tilmisartan, for example, yeah. Valsartan. Uh, low sartan, they all end in sartans. Um, they're newer, uh, more uh, like they're uh, first line of therapy for hypertension, basically. Uh, a few years ago, the uh, ACE inhibitor, which are uh, angiotensin uh, coordinate enzyme inhibitors, they were the first line of therapy, but now research has shown that ARBs are slightly better, more efficacious in uh, blood pressure management, and also they are, tend to have less side effects. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, by side effects, people do not understand, and, and people were asking me, you know, why aren't you on blood pressure medication from the get-go and this and that? All of these drugs have potential side effects. Right. Some people can have policy, uh, can have, uh, you know, uh, problems with um, excessive uh, drops in blood pressure and having like uh, hypotension, uh, that can mediate a cascade of problems. Some people have photosensitivity from these drugs, like they can they can have like problems with uh, 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 sun exposure. Some people can develop autoimmune diseases from ACE inhibitors. Like the, people think that there is a freebie, like there are drugs that are like one hundred percent, you know, side effect free, and you're just a retard if you're not taking them. When reality, like everything can cause a potential right. side effect. If you look up on, just look this up, look up um, a lupus-like syndrome, drug-induced lupus-like syndrome. This is basically a medical condition where your body presents all the side effects of lupus erythro um, erythromatosis uh, mediated through drug exposure. And a lot of drugs like diuretics, like hydrochlorothiazide, which is the, um, uh, or diazide, the drug yeah, that's diazide used. Diazide is one of the most popular diuretics in bodybuilding. Yes. So that drug can cause lupus like syndrome. And if it active, if, if, if it causes that, you're stuck with an autoimmune response that may last for months. Like it can completely fuck you up. Uh, you know, minoxidil is also in this category for people that are using it on the hair. Uh, so, so the, my point is that these drugs have all potential side effects. 
uh, and and nothing is a, is a so no. So your your forewarning. This is a forewarning <laughs> for the people watching. Is he saying get all the variables he mentioned before instead of just like all right, I'm gonna listen to Alec on what drugs to yes. add and not even think right. about anything he mentioned before. Because the whole exactly. thing with me is he's trying to harm mitigate and keep me away from all the blood pressure meds if I don't need them. Because when he adds them in, then he's dealing with potential cascading side effects of adding them in. Yeah, and again, even though the likelihood there's there's a risk to reward ratio basically that you have to take into uh, consideration, but like ideally you want to be on less drugs than necessary and that's simply how it is you know people are really quick to jump the gun i know personally people who had absurd side effects from drugs that people are just like oh nothing happens like even for the cerebral license like i have you know extreme nausea and diarrhea from it and you know people argue online that there is no side effects to it right mm. and if you look at the pamphlet here like it says that it can cause side effects such as nausea vomiting like like they're listed but people are like oh nothing so like uh, you can die off of aspirin if you cannot met metabolize it uh, uh properly mm -hmm. so we have everybody has a uh, you know different genetic polymorphism uh we, we uh, uh our different uh pharmacodynamics so like drugs at certain doses uh, affect us differently so it's not a joke uh back to the blood pressure thing so like first line of therapy would be an arp um, angiotensin receptor blocker. If that's uh, if that's not enough to you know um, to relieve uh, what, the, the what blood pressure, what goal should they be looking for? Like, okay, all right, right. like um, hypertensive stage two, stage one. Right. Like, I'm on this cycle. When right. am I like right. mitigating this? You know. Okay, so here's the deal. First, let's uh, let's uh, you know discuss the, the the references. Ideally, you know, blood pressure you want to be like 120 over 60. Uh, you know, slightly elevated is considered up until 129 below 80 diastolic. North of 130 to 139 over 80 to 89 is stage one. Above 140 over 90 is stage two. And 180 over 120 is like hypertensive crisis stage three, which by the way, uh, George Peterson uh, died from that. So uh, in this situation, you'd want to, like this is kind of individual based off of sh the sheer fact that we are different body weights. Like if you have like, for example, right now, your baseline is like 135 over 90, for example. So like you're like stage, stage one hypertensive. He's talking like, about my log, right? So he's breaking down me <coughs> for an example. You would have to test your own, right? Right, right. So, like, right now, and you've been like this for, you know, your whole life, for example. Mm -hmm. If you were to take a blood pressure medication, you know, therapy, and you just drop to, let's say, 110 over, you know, 55, 60, whatever, that IQ drop in blood pressure would be a, a new baseline for you, and that may cause side effects like drowniness, reflex tachycardia, you feeling like shit. So, like, it's not a, you know, free ride, as I said. Mm -hmm. Just, and this is through sheer uh, 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 alternation in blood pressure. I'm not talking about the potential metabolic problems that these drugs can cause and also hyperkalemia and other things. So, I'm just talking just by just block, uh, lowering, altering your blood pressure uh, acutely. So, it, I would suggest that up until the elevated phase, like up until 130 over 80, I would I would say it's 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 good so to speak if somebody is like uh, you know above uh, two hundred pounds like or, or a hundred uh, uh, kg, uh, but again this is uh, individual, um, and and I will recommend for first to try to mitigate this through uh, diet and lifestyle changes rather than pharmacological interventions. Um, uh, as far as uh, uh, therapy goes, so ARBs are first line of therapy. Second line of therapy, they add diuretics on top of the ARBs. I highly against, uh, advise against this. The reason why is that they give the, they give them to people that are, you know, uh, to old people essentially who are not athletes, who are, you know, they don't, they don't lose a lot of electrolytes uh, through vigorous uh, exercises. They're not, you know, fucking with the raw system through androgens and all that. So, like, they, they don't give a shit about performance. If you add, you know, diuretics chronically, 
uh, it, it can mess mess you up, and they also directly harm the kidneys. So, uh, good nephrologists, uh, and it's a newer practice. They tend to combine an ARP with an ACE inhibitor in uh, in the event of an ARP not being uh, sufficient. And also, this combination further enhances uh, 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 kidney pro re renal protectiveness. Basically, they prevent proteinuria. So, what happens when you have hypertension? Uh, 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 the, the, basically, the protein particles get pushed through the glomeruli of the kidney, and they basically damage the, the glomeruli themselves, causing uh, uh, kidney damage. So, and, and that's basically how protein urea, uh, losing of protein in the urine happens. ARPs and ACE inhibitors combined with ARPs basically prevent this uh, directly, so they're also renal, uh, renal protective in this uh, regard. Um, Lastly, I see people using beta blockers often here, uh, especially in the uh, in the bodybuilding uh, uh, context. Very especially popular in the biohacking, get the <sighs> jump straight into beta blockers. Yes, yes. The problem with beta blockers is that people do not. Uh, first of all, when is when are beta blockers indicated? They're essentially indicated when there is a, a, a fall in ejection fraction a pathological uh, fall in ejection fraction of the heart. And they basically, the whole idea is for them to block the adrenergic beta receptors in the heart and to give the heart more time to rest between pumps and therefore increase the, the, the ejection fraction and uh, the heart's uh, function. Unless you have this problem, you're not a candidate for a chronic uh, beta blocking uh, agent. Uh, 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 pro there are a lot of problems that beta blockers can cause, both from a metabolic standpoint, because we have beta receptors everywhere in our lungs, in our muscles, in our uh, gastrointestinal tract, uh, uh, in our fat. We have beta-3 receptors in our brain, in the nervous system. So, like, blocking that would be the opposite. That would be um, uh, a sympatholytic effect, which is the opposite of what clenbuterol would do. So, like, you essentially would basically slow yourself down, in, a, in layman words, uh, 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 saying it. Uh, they can cause problems with uh, nightmares, uh, ejaculation, uh, uh, and so forth. So, and people kind of uh, neglect the fact that once you block beta receptors and when you go off, there's a rebound. Like, you will have a rebound. You know, you cannot say, oh, I'm, uh, I'm having, like, you know, slight anxiety or, like, you know, this and that. Or I'm, I'm taking trend, for example, and my heart rate is elevated or whatever drug. I'll just take a beta blocker to counteract it. But you'll That's have to come up. what you, you'll see all these people just like, fuck it, right. just go on a beta blocker. There's nothing to right. it other than that. Right, but you're, yeah, but like when you're, when you stop it, like you have, you have a rebound. Like, because your, your, your body, your, your heart will basically be uh, blinded of catecholamines. And when you, you know, unblock those receptors, you have a f influx of, uh, of, of nor noradrenaline and adrenaline binding. So, like, that's a pretty shitty way to go about things. Rather, try not to get into the, that state right. and, and try to see way, how is it, it's mediated and try, uh, and try to tackle it through, through other uh, mechanisms, right? If it's like a nervous system issue, you know, rather than blocking, you know, beta receptors, um, shoot for something that would, you know, slow down the sympathetic nervous system, calm you down, you know, rather than, you know, using uh, beta blockers or some people use benzos, you know, which is even more retarded. So, you know, I cannot sleep, therefore I'll just take Xanax on trend, you know, and they just end up oh, in the fucking, man. they just wreck their, you know, their, their garbage uh, system and they basically end up both uh, chronically anxious, they cannot fall asleep, and they get drug addicted to the benzodiazepines. Uh, and the withdrawals that those uh, shitty medicines have is, are significantly worse than doing, you know, stimulants and, and, and other hardcore drugs. So uh, that's a whole different uh, topic. So uh, moral of the story is uh, to summarize, you know, try to tackle the actual cause rather than effect that's going on that's your best bang for your buck and that's how you you know uh, uh you'll have you know uh, rational uh 
uh, um, uh, approach and longevity, whatever you're you're doing. Um, and also always, you know, taking into consideration potential side effects and look up, you know, anything that potentially can happen. Because especially in the biohacking and, uh, and, and bodybuilding, you know, everything is drugs, drugs, drugs. But like when you're up, when something goes bo- uh, wrong, like you have no fucking idea mm-hmm. how things are getting mediated and which pathway is, uh, what signaling is causing this and that. And like, you know, and nobody can even help you. Like if you go to a doctor and you tell him that you're on 30 drugs unprescribed, like he would tell you, like, what the fuck do you expect? You know, yeah, what am I supposed to like, tell him? What is you know, he supposed to do? You know, that's the problem. So, uh, you know, I'm just urging to, for people to uh, be rational. Um, mm-hmm. And that's pretty much it. You still have open um, slots for coaching, right? Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I, I mainly, you know, uh, shoot for having like consultations because I, you know, do like an hour consultation, which never ends up being an hour. Uh, it's always like an hour and a half, even two hours. But you know, uh, that way I can reach even more people. Um, you know, and you know, basically help as many people as possible. Yeah, I also do monthly coaching. Uh, you can hit me up on IG, and also working on a website that. We'll be launching that would make things more uh, more practical and, and, and easier. Awesome. Well, always love it, Alec. You guys got to give a thumbs up. That, like, every single podcast Alec does is just a gem. You know, it's not even funny, right? We say it how it is. We chirp some of your idols, but at the same time, we yeah. chirped ourselves, right? Exactly. We talk exactly. shit on our shitty genetics. We are being right. blunt about ourselves. We don't have our egos on this giant pedestal, and neither should you have these other people on the pedestal. Like, just look at it for what it is. And I think I've the ne- take the takeaway with Alec is like, have some sort of inclination of what you're doing before you just start throwing shit into the mix. Exactly. And in regards to talking shit, like I've. N- the most I've talked shit about somebody is myself. Like I've put myself down, uh, not intentionally down, but like I've been very harsh and critical of myself uh, to the point where like I'm significantly more harsher on myself than uh, anybody I've, I've been on, uh, anybody else that I've been on. Just that people really do not Signal want to. Now. Yeah, p- people really do not want to hear what what the, the harsh reality of things. Because you know they they would prefer bitter lies. I mean, uh, sweet lies and bitter truths, and and that's pretty much it. But like that that leads nowhere. And you know the only way is through uh, being real, being truthful, uh, and through building integrity, where uh, you can be sustainable and and have longevity both physical, mentally, uh, and overall in life, in business, in relationship, in in anything. Alec and I always seek evolution. And we both faced roadblocks that have forced us to evolve. Exactly. So people might have not faced those roadblocks yet. They'll hit them eventually. And then oh, they like, always come. You know? They always come. They always come. Sooner or later. It's a matter of being prepared for them. Uh, and otherwise, you know, they can, they can shock you to the point where you wouldn't be able to get, uh, get up. That was the whole point of why I talked about, you know, in the whole segment when we started off the whole podcast. It was more so from an educational standpoint exactly. rather than this is not personal when we got no. here, it ain't personal it's just about enlightenment and the general idea exactly exactly all right guys sincerely appreciate it i hope to see you guys in my next video and obviously give the goat alec a follow alec what should they follow or what should they call com- i can't talk anymore that's how long it's been what should they comment if they made it this far hmm interesting what should they say? That's how mm. you know the real, the real peas. Yeah, you, you go ahead and tell for this one. I told that about the, the last podcast. Comment come. Thug Alec for his haircut. <laughs> He's the most okay. intelligent thug in Macedonia. So Thug right. Alec. I'll Good see one. you guys in like my it. next video. Take it easy, guys. Bye.